Okay, hello everyone. Thank you very much uh, for coming to today's AIWA Los Angeles Las Vegas section uh, e-town hall meeting. Uh, with, uh, to, uh, we have two very uh, great speakers and a very yeah. fantastic, uh, exciting talks uh, centered on hypersonic simulation related to that. Uh, no top secret, don't worry about it, uh, but it's very inspiring. Uh, so the first speaker is Dr. Swati Sasena from ANSYS, and the, the second speaker will be uh, Mr. Stephen Thomas from Parsons. So you can see the agenda here. Uh, uh, first apology, Dr. Chandrasekha Sowane, our session chair, uh, has been quite busy these days with uh, his uh, lunar, uh, you know, uh, project, you know, uh, for his company. So he asked me to welcome everyone and uh, start the program today. Uh, so around 10:10, 10, 10:15, 10, 10, we'll start with Dr. Swati Sasena, and uh, uh, followed by uh, Mr. Stephen Thomas. Uh, so uh, if needed, we can extend the program. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so uh, first of all, some logistics. So if you are interested in volunteering with us, um, uh, you know, the, the, so you can email us. This is the email for our section chair. You can also contact me. You can also look at our events, aiw-lalv.org slash events. And you look at, uh, highly well suggest to look at the AIW membership program at aiw.org slash membership. Uh, Zoom has improved the security issues uh, uh, since last year. So, but if you have any concern, you can use the dial in, uh, but please don't discuss any top secret or sensitive business over the Zoom. You know, uh, the program is intended to inspire people. Uh, so not uh, to lose your company secret or something. Uh, so uh, logistic, you know, uh, please try to uh, uh, utilize the Q&A uh, box. Uh, you're welcome to use the chat uh, to chat with a speaker or fellow attendees. But if you type your question you, in, in chat, it will be uh, buried there. It's hard to know it's a question or just the chatting. You can also raise hand. Uh, we'll enable you when the speaker feels uh, proper. Uh, but more, that will probably more toward the end, unless you know the speaker want to engage interactive discussion during the presentation. And uh, if you are concerned about your internet speed, you can uh, try to dial in. That generally improve the speed, or you can uh, you know try to uh, test your speed and see if it works better. Uh, and we have to thank the AIW headquarters because the Zoom platform was pro provided by them and it's uh, kind of expensive, so we really appreciate it. Uh, and the other thing is if some glitch happens, please just keep, try keep trying to reconnect. Uh, if anything, that's just temporary. Uh, a few words about the local uh, uh, Los Angeles, Las Vegas area. Uh, we are really, really blessed you know, for the Southern California aerospace uh, uh, Community, even though we know Elon Musk has moved to Texas, but you know, he still have the SpaceX presence here. Uh, so that we have a lot of exciting companies, Northrop Grumman building James Webb Telescope, uh, you know, the defense projects, uh, and uh, then of course with JPL, uh, Mars Inside, and a very exciting next month, the Mars 2020 Perseverance with a helicopter, Mars helicopter. Then we have people, aerospace corporations, SpaceX, Boeing, you're doing uh, you know, as uh, space debris mitigation. Uh, then we have, you know, uh, people work aerospace corporation doing, you know, planetary defense, actual exploration. And then we have Virgin Galactic, you know, space doing, SpaceX doing space tourism. And they just heard the great news for uh, Virgin Orbit. Congratulations to uh, Virgin Orbit for the, the successful launch uh, for the satellite into space, into orbit, uh, into space. And uh, of course, you know, SLS student project, you know, all very exciting. And uh, all those uh, exciting things and success cannot be uh, possible without the diligence of our uh, volunteers and officers. You know, we are all volunteers, we are not paid, you know, then the, uh, just uh, dedicate to serve the community uh, to develop membership and aerospace in, in, in the Los Angeles, Las Vegas section area, uh, led by Dr. Jeffrey Prochelle, head of a fellow, and uh, uh, Mr. Robert Friend, director in the Boeing Defense, uh, Space and Defense, and Marsha uh, Westcott from Aerospace Station uh, Corporation, and the many uh, dedicated uh, officers like Marty Wardman, uh, Las Vegas chair, uh, many other people, uh, really highly respectful. 
And uh, one thing mentioned about the AIW, AIW Engage website uh, is engage.aiw.org. If you are join the AIW member, uh, you can immediately enjoy the, it's like a social media or uh, bulletin board. You can chat with uh, uh, fellow members, uh, uh, national, international experts. And uh, we keep doing uh, events to keep people uh, network with each other and know what's going on, get inspired, get excited. You know, that's what we're doing today. <laughs> we got two very inspiring speakers uh, today. So um, this, these are something coming up. Uh, so let's um, uh, try to keep everybody uh, excited and know uh, and networking, very important. Uh, Join professional society of uh, great uh, benefits uh, for professional development and STEM education. Uh, especially AIW is the leading uh, professional organization in aerospace and STEM. And uh, AIW's uh, headquarters is in Western Virginia, close to Stephen. And uh, uh, our local headquarters uh, for us, Los Angeles Lakers section is in El, Sada El Segundo, California. Uh, so, uh, join AWA membership, we get access to ARC research because we do research, we publish, and uh, we, you know, uh, educate and have a great foundation, AWA foundation for education. Different level of membership, educator membership is free, and, uh, uh, you know, there's a great benefit. Uh, please take a look, AWA.org slash membership. And uh, these are some contact, you know, for if you need more information. Uh, the e-membership actually is disconnected, uh, discontinued. Uh, but if any question, you can also contact me, post question as well. So our first speaker today uh, is Dr. Swati Sasena. Is a, she's a technical and project manager in ANSYS, uh, a company called ANSYS, doing great job for simulation. Uh, she's a PhD and uh, she's also a other lifetime senior member. She uh, got a bachelor degree uh, technology from the prestigious IIT Kanpur and the got a master and a PhD uh, degree in aerospace engineering from Penn State, another great, oh, sorry, another great aerospace uh, uh, university. Uh, she's, um, uh, she was the lead, uh, lead research scientist and program manager in GE Global Research. Uh, then he became the technical project manager at ANSYS since 2018. Uh, her in area of interest, including uh, the very exciting machine learning in simulation and also engineering design and BSE PIDO, fluid, uh, fluid uh, mechanics and aeroacoustics, gas turbine design. And uh, she has 20 plus publications and two patents. Uh, so it's our great pleasure honor to welcome Dr. Swati Sasena. Thank you so much, Ken, for the introduction. Uh, let me share my screen here. Do you see it fine? Yes, I can see it. Okay, okay, awesome. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. And uh, thank you um, AIA uh, LALV chapter for giving me the opportunity to speak today about uh, the role of simulation in designing uh, hypersonic vehicles. So as, as you all probably know, this, this is a, a, a very interesting area. It has been an area of research for several years. Several uh, prototypes have been built so far and tested so far. And if we look in terms of the physics involved in designing these vehicles, it gets really, really complex and challenging because of the operating and environmental conditions around hypersonic vehicles, right? So uh, it's it's really interesting area for us as a simulation company to investigate as well and develop solutions that can be used to design these vehicles more efficiently and uh, more uh, optimized design. So a lot of us have been working in this area at ANSYS and uh, I have uh, I have a list of my uh, people, uh, the colleagues, my colleagues who have contributed to this uh, presentation and who have run validation studies in different, using different ANSYS solvers and compared it with the experimental data and so on. So uh, 
with that i i will give you a very quick introduction to the company before going into the uh, the topic of interest for today which is hypersonics so ansys uh, we we are a simulation provider we provide a entire end to end simulation platform which enables our customers to model uh, or from a chip all the way to system of systems and uh, mission engineering so all the verticals going from aerospace automotive energy healthcare high tech and so on use these uh, solutions these uh, multi physics uh, physics based solvers and develop next generation products which are enabling technologies like autonomy electrification 5g industrial internet of things and so on and then there are end to end workflows that are provided by these uh, uh, simulation solvers which enable the product design so for example a chip package system would give you all the tools that you need to simulate the performance of a chip on installed in a system and ansys cloud and our uh, SPDM simulation process and data management platform enables all these all these solutions. So you can use Ansys Cloud to deploy these large cases and run them in parallel. Uh, there is a there is a solution for managing all the material data as well, and this becomes even more important when we. Uh, look in uh, look at hypersonic vehicle design because material is an important uh, component there that has to be studied and made sure that the material would survive as at those temperatures and at those conditions so tracing the material properties all the way from uh, through your entire product development life cycle becomes even more important uh, the different physics that can be modeled with ansys tools go from structures so structural analysis to flow simulation around the vehicle to electromagnetic simulation which is important for designing uh, components like antennas and radars on the on the vehicles optical tools which can model different kinds of sensors and can also work in a integrated environment to see how those sensors will talk to each other and will evaluate the effectiveness and the semiconductor tools to which help in the uh, the smart chip designs which are integral part of these uh, these uh, vehicles or these uh, products for aerospace industry so here is the outline of my presentation for today i'll briefly touch upon what uh, what flow regime hypersonics deals with why it's important right now and why are we investing so much in the uh, studies in this uh, of hypersonic uh, vehicle design and development uh, overview of ansys solutions for hypersonics what ansys can can do in this area and how we can support the design and development of these products then i'll go over few use cases there are many more that we have looked at internally and have validated and benchmarked our solvers but i'll have picked just few of them to give you an example of uh, of uh, what what can be done with the simulation and how it helps in the product design we are also collaborating with universities with primes on this topic in in this area and have been jointly working on some solutions together to enable simulation for hypersonics and i will also uh, tell you a bit about a training session that we are conducting to train users on our hypersonic uh, solutions and a list of validation cases that we have done so far so why why now why is the hypersonic uh, vehicle design investing in 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 this area important uh, if we look in terms of the national security we are we we keep reading in the in the 
news and also in the public domain and also the us uh, dod is well aware of the work that has been going on in other countries in this area and the uh, uh, and, and the threat that is it, it poses to us and we get this continued threat from adversaries. So it becomes really important for uh, US to invest in this area. And this is reflected in the uh, Pentagon's budget that was approved for hypersonics related work last year. And it, it's going up a uh, lot more, you will see a lot more uh, RFIs, RFQs coming out for from DOD on this topic, and both and uh, industry, academia, and primes, all of them have been looking at different aspects of the hypersonic vehicle design now, and more and more academic uh, institutions are being established, labs are being established, testing facilities are being established to. Uh, in test hypersonic uh, vehicle vehicles. Now these give you an operational advantage if it look in terms of both military operations and there are there is there is investigation going on on the commercial aspect of hypersonic uh, uh, vehicles as well. So they offer uh, potential for military operations for long from long ranges. So you can you can since you are flying at at high speed, you, your range is you can cover a much longer range with res shorter response times and enhanced effectiveness. So this this gives you an edge in uh, military warfare. And also in terms of commercial applications, people are looking at uh, hypersonic commercial uh, vehicles as well, where they'll be you'll be able to fly from one part of the world to another all across the globe in just matter of uh, a couple of hours. So there, there has been there has been a lot of lot of interest. So now when it comes to the design of these hypersonic vehicles, it gets very challenging. So they fly or at least part of their trajectory is at a Mach number which is greater than five. And this is a Mach number one is the speed of sound in air. So of, uh, you are at least the, the vehicle is at least going to fly at five times of that speed for part of its trajectory. Now this poses extreme operating conditions and unique challenges in both design and sustainment of these vehicles. And most of the aerospace vehicles, their lifetime spans over decades too. So you have to make sure they are in operating conditions, they are safe to operate for uh, several decades. So that's an additional challenge. Now, if you break it down into the areas where, into the uh, physics-based areas where we need to pay attention to their, to their design, it you can break it down into propulsion system, the coupled effect of aerothermodynamics, airframe propulsion integration, and you have to pay a lot more attention on the material selection side because there are going to be effects like ablation and so on. The structural integrity of the vehicle and thermal protection systems. The navigation guidance avionics, it, it becomes even more challenging because at these uh, speeds, uh, there are uh, things like ionization around the vehicle, which can disrupt and interrupt the communication that, that's going on uh, between two vehicles between the uh, and between uh, uh, when, when you are operating for safe operation of these vehicles. So guidance and control at this speed also becomes a challenge. Now how simulation can help. Uh, there have been a lot of tests, physical tests that have been done for these hypersonic prototypes. But one of the big challenges with these physical tests, it's, it's very difficult to create the real flight conditions and environment conditions around the vehicle and simulate its entire trajectory. So physical testing is also very expensive and it's extremely time consuming. So that not only limits your uh, design space, you can only test few scenarios in your physical tests, but that also extends your design uh, 
cycle time because you are spending a lot of time in uh, physical tests. Virtual prototyping is, is the solution which can help you elevate both these uh, challenges. Uh, simulation for these vehicles at these conditions poses its own challenges. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to enable the technology to simulate these, uh, these conditions effectively, but there has been a lot of progress made so far. And especially with high performance computing, with GPU enablement of these solvers, you're now able to run these uh, cases much faster and much more efficiently and simulate these real flight conditions over the entire uh, trajectory and, the, and accelerate the design cycle. So let's break it down further. If we look in terms of the areas where we need to focus when we design these vehicles and then how it, uh, the simulation can support in each of these areas. So as we looked earlier, this propulsion is, is a very important uh, uh, component when it comes to the vehicle design. The aerothermal interaction, aerothermal aspect of uh, the physics, the structural integrity materials, we have already discussed about it. And everything must work closely together. So that's, that's the key. You cannot uh, be, uh, you cannot break it down and then just model or look at it separately and not worry about other other areas at all so they it it works as a system and that is that is very important so the simulation environment that you are going to use should be able to talk and communicate between these different aspects. So there's a strong coupling required for different to simulate, accurately simulate different physical phenomena here. And <clears throat> system integration is, is very important. So if you look in each of these areas, there are different physics that needs to be modeled. Uh, when we are uh, working on this, these vehicle designs. So if we start from the um, top left of this slide, this is this is a busy slide, but I wanted to list out all the areas that uh, one needs to focus on when when we are when we are looking at the uh, this product development life cycle, right? So the aerothermodynamics, there are heat fluxes and aero forces that have to be modeled to get the loads that will be there on the vehicle. There will be shock formation at these speeds, so you need to understand the location of the shock shocks and its and their behavior, how they are how they are moving. Uh, the uh, if you look at the flow physics, the, the one of the key things is to model the laminar turbulent transition accurately, location where the the this transition would take place, and the flow control. Uh, if you are going to use any control devices to uh, change the flow pattern around the vehicle. There will be chemical reaction uh, going on at certain, when it reaches a certain temperature and around the vehicle. And there will be, uh, there are things like chemical and thermodynamic non-equilibrium that needs to be modeled. And there will be a material uh, degradation and uh, uh, which is, um, <clears throat> also a phenomena that we need to take into account for these vehicles. Uh, when I talk about uh, PDO process integration and design optimization, this relates to what I touched upon earlier that this, it needs to be worked as a system. It can't operate in different, in a disconnected fashion. So multi-physics is very important. Uh, you need to, there are several, several scenarios where the thermal, aero, structural, electromagnetic effects need to be coupled. And if you have a platform where you can seamlessly connect between these different physics, that will give, that will give you a lot more uh, flexibility to simulate these uh, your entire design space and accurately predict the the behavior now the third uh, topic that i have here is communication and tracking and this relates to the uh, the control and navigation aspect of the vehicle 
where you are mod, you need to accurately see if your antennas, your sensors, your RF, how, what would be your RF signature? What would be the structural deformation, impact of uh, vibrations or, and phenomena like communication blackout? How would that be for, for the op operation or for the entire operational envelope of your vehicle? And if that could pose any threats on the performance of the vehicle. At such high temperature, there will be structural deformation. So because of the aero loads, which is can be captured with this coupled modeling of uh, fluid structural interaction uh, to make sure that your structure will remain uh, functional. There is to have the enough structural integrity left and the material properties again need to be accurately modeled and tracked through the entire uh, <clears throat> trajectory. Propulsion is uh, a very important aspect and that relates to modeling, accurate modeling of combustion. What kind of uh, fuel you are going to use, what, uh, what kind of rocket and the loads that it would have on the structure, again, resulting into some structural deformation. The thermal management is uh, uh, it needs to be needs to be modeled as well. So different uh, ways of uh, uh, thermal <clears throat> radiation, convection, conduction, conjugate heat transfer, cooling. Uh, there will be phase phase changes at these temperatures and uh, pressures, and the electronics that are on board. We need to make sure that they are going to stay safe and uh, operate through the entire uh, uh, profile as well. And then the system integration is uh, also becomes important because most of these vehicles are not going to operate in silos. They will be part of a network. Different vehicles will be talking to each other. And in a, in a realistic uh, warfare situation, the, you will have to be continuously communicating with these vehicles. So the sensor uh, fusion, actuation, the control and mission level simulation also becomes very important. So this is these are a lot of areas and uh, this is, Where, where we are at answers in all these areas. So this is just a quick checklist. It's, uh, it's not to say that we, we are uh, <clears throat> perfect in all these areas. We have all the solutions. This is, these are the constant area of research. We are adding uh, capabilities to model all these uh, as, we, as we continue to develop our solvers. But as you can see, with, with there are a lot of uh, green check marks here. So there are a lot of areas where we have done a lot of uh, development work, a lot of validation and benchmarking. So I'll touch upon a uh, few examples from those areas to give you a better idea of what, what can be done and how it can, it can help in the, in the design process. So if we look in, uh, in terms of uh, aerodynamics, uh, the different aspects of the flow physics that needs to be modeled, going from chemical non-equilibrium to ablation, cooling, conjugate heat transfer, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> there have been a lot of validations that we have done in this in this area, and there is a there is a list of these. Uh, validations that I have on the on the slide here. There are experimental data that are available in open literature and we have used uh, those to benchmark the, uh, the solvers in this case. So I'll just talk about going to little more detail for th these three cases. So the first one is a aerospike model that was uh, published um, I think a couple of a couple of decades ago, the experimental data, and we have run simulations and compared our results with the experimental data. And also, we went a step further and did our design optimization study for this disk that you see in front of uh, the vehicle 
to using the adjoint approach to <clears throat> see to minimize minimize the drag on the vehicle. The second case is uh, you know for replicates a, a re-entry capsule a simulation at Mark 29, where you are going to see reacting flows, and uh, that has been modeled in, in this uh, case study. The third one is the uh, scramjet simulation, design simulation, and different kinds of designs were simulated, and the effect of, uh, and the, the results were compared with experimental data at uh, <clears throat> for for this is cramjet design so i'll go into detail for these three cases so the first one is the validation of aero spiked missile at mark 6 so this is based on a, a study and results that were published by nasa langley and eglin air force uh, based on aerospike geometry and uh, aero disk. So this is, this is one of the Schillerian images that they had published, and this is at Mark 6. So what we have done is we have performed the flow simulations on the same geometry at two angles of attack, zero degrees of uh, angle and uh, 10 degrees. And the, uh, the flow conditions are also mentioned here. The, pressure and temperature around the vehicle. And this is, you can see the geometry of the vehicle with a disc in front of it, the direction of the flow as well. So the Schellerin image is compared with the uh, flow simulation at the down in the uh, image on the, on the below on this slide at, at 10 degrees of angle of attack. And the location of the shock was captured very well in the flow solver. Uh, this is the front dome of the disc. And as you go in the azimuthal direction, you can see that the pattern on the surface of the, of the disc were captured really well. These are pressure contours. And the pressure was uh, compared with the experimental data. So all the symbols, the top three symbols that are for the experimental data, uh, all at 10 degrees of angle of attack. And the spike is on as well at three azimuthal angles, 0, 90, and 180 degrees. And the continuous uh, lines are the uh, <clears throat> simulation results. And you can see that these peaks were captured really well as we go away from the uh, of the, the as as you go on the surface of this uh, missile now after this validation a uh, design optimization study was also performed for this missile and the only the aero disk shape was modified. So everything else was kept constant, only this aero disk was modified. And the adjoint solver was used to do this uh, design optimization study at Mark 6. So the overall vehicle uh, drag reduction on the vehicle was targeted as uh, at 2%, 2% reduction in dra drag compared to the baseline design. And we also want to make sure that the shock is away from the red dome. So that, that will be the case. We don't want to modify this design in a way where we, the, it results into uh, shock being closer to the red dome. So it's the original design and you see the, the total amount of drag. And this is the optimal optimized design that the solver came up with in two adjoint iterations and the drag was reduced by 2%, which was our original target. So this just demonstrates the, uh, the capability and also how the simulation can be used to do different design studies on these vehicles and also further optimize the design on the, on the hypersonic vehicles. You might not have the entire uh, bandwidth to do uh, physical tests on all these designs, but once you have validated your solver for some selected designs, you can trust it to further enhance and optimize your design. 
The second case is a flow over a sphere at Mark 29. And here are the details of the setup. So it's a laminar flow and the diameter of the hemisphere is around 61 millimeter. The pressure and temperature values are also mentioned here. And the Gupta model has been used to model the uh, chemical sources, chemical reactions in the energy equations. So there is a, a mixture, it's a mixture of 11 species and 21 reactions, and they are all mentioned here. And uh, if you're interested, I also have reference to this model where it was, uh, which was, which was used in modeling the chemistry here. The isothermal condition is imposed at the at the wall of the sphere at 1500 Kelvin, and a structured mesh was used to model the hemisphere. And the axisymmetric flow is uh, assumed as well. So you can see the the conditions. Uh, on this snapshot as well in terms of the pressure, temperature, and also the species composition. Uh, so the snapshots for Mach number, pressure, and temperature are, are shown here. And very close to the hemisphere, you can see the rise in, in temperature and pressure, and uh, also the stagnation uh, region here. Uh, now the values were extracted as we move away from the hemisphere for temperature, density, and mass fraction of three species are plotted here. So oxygen uh, atom, uh, oxygen atom, and nitrogen. The values are compared with the experimental data that's published in these two references, and they they are they you can see there's a very very good agreement for both temperature and density. And the mass fraction of species uh, is tracked really well as well as well in this case, which was very important. That was the key uh, physics that we wanted to capture in this validation. You can see the the oxygen uh, variation as is, as it goes uh, away from the hemisphere. The third case is the scramjet design at Mark 6.5 cruise conditions. And this is a technology demonstrator vehicle that was being developed at IIT Madras for to be used by the Defense Research Lab in India. So this is an unmanned scramjet demonstration aircraft for hypersonic uh, flight. So the researchers, what they did is they first evaluated the ability of using the solver, so ANSYS Fluent in this case, to provide accurate design predictions for this uh, scramjet by simulating a scaled down intake design. So first they simulated a scaled down design for which wind tunnel results uh, were uh, were available and they have already been published in public domain and I have the, I have the reference here. So first the scaled down version was simulated and you can you can see the uh, see the results here. And if we look in the look at these results in little more detail, so the scaled intake uh, simulation results match the physical experiments. you can see the, so design here and there are two movable parts for the call and both these the values were compared for both these parts and the experimental and uh, simulation data they they uh, agree pretty well for the entire entire region then the full scale uh, design of the combustor was simulated and then some modifications were also studied uh, on the combustion and this was all done in simulation. So the pressure recovery here we are plotting on the final design that they came up with and the pressure is plotted against the distance on the combustion and the Simulation data is compared with the experimental results. So there are four regions you can see, and the red uh, and the green dots are experimental data, and the curves are the simulation results. And they they agree pretty well. They're able to capture the spikes for uh, that we saw in the experimental data. So this was this was kind of a virtual wind tunnel 
that they wanted to build to be able to study these designs and make these design variations and uh, do some really accelerated virtual tests for uh, the uh, for the defense lab So now moving on to a, a, a fourth um, uh, use case here, which involves uh, two physics. So here we will be coupling structural and flow uh, physics together to study the effect of structural, the, the effect of arrow loads on the structure. So you can do the entire coupling on the single platform and it's it's very automated it has it has been there for several years on ansys platform now we have come to a point where we have fully automated this workflow so you don't have to uh, <clears throat> do most of it manually it uh, transfers the required information from one solver to another on its own, which really eases, makes it easy to use. And also the meshing and also post-processing is um, automated as well. You can see is, there is a, you can define a lot of parameters that you need, want to vary in this design and it, it will run the entire design space and give you things like response surface curves and uh, <clears throat> surfaces, which will enable you to interpret your results very quickly. So this is an example of the fluid structural uh, interaction workflow. So you start with the geometry and you, here are the flow conditions, conditions mentioned here. So it's a projectile study at Mark 10. The flow, condi flow direction is also uh, shown here. You do the uh, initial setup on the geometry, calculate the flow field inside and outside the vehicle. Then you export the required information in terms of the pressure and arrow loads on the structure. So here you can see the mesh that will be used for the structural analysis. So the solver automatically does that. It maps the forces on the structural mesh, mesh does the uh, analysis, structural analysis because of those, the effect of uh, those forces, the temperature and the pressure, and it predicts and simulates the deformed shape. So you see two, you can see two surfaces here. One of them is undeformed, the other one is deformed. And uh, you can see the, the similar effect on the snapshots shown on the, uh, on the slide down here. So the total di displacement on biconic with flaps. So that's, that was the use case due to thermal and pressure loads, right? So this is a typical banana effect that you see on at these extreme uh, operating conditions. And this, this was, uh, this validation study was done to uh, demonstrate this effect and uh, how this can be modeled in simulation. So just uh, to uh, show it in little more detail, and as I mentioned, it uh, can be done with both ANSYS fluid solvers and also with another third-party fluid solvers as well. So you don't have to, the entire workflow doesn't have to be just ANSYS tools. It's very much flexible in using uh, any other uh, tool that you want to integrate with the mechanical solution. The structural deformation is shown in a magnified view here uh, to just emphasize the fact that the these deformations do happen and they can be modeled with this. So you need this strong coupling to, to model these uh, uh, deformations. So now uh, the the second area that uh, we can look at is uh, propulsion. We have already looked at one use case related to it, which was the scramjet combustion case. That was uh, the way where they were looking at uh, the scramjet design at Mark 6.5. 
so there are there are going to be other phenomena that can be modeled effectively with simulation related to acoustics and some acoustic instabilities. Uh, the fuel injection, fuel injection is 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 important to model the how the uh, the nozzle. Uh, design and plume how how the structure the flow structures would be in that design and which because that could really impact the the acoustic uh, signature as well and uh, the another topic could be the cryogenic fluid storage and sloshing and this is if i just see if i'm this movie plays here and this is a fuel tank and when the when the vehicle is moving there are there is there are forces on the walls of the fuel tank because of the movement of the flow and uh, this these this can be modeled really well with with simulation and these sometimes become very important to uh, accurately predict to understand its effect on other components as well Right. So another important uh, topic is materials and structures, and we looked at an example where we did this uh, the coupled simulation between fluids and uh, mechanical loads to predict the structural deformation. There could be a fracture or fatigue analysis that needs to be done. There could be a crack that it's important to see if a crack happens, how it will grow. Which can be which can be accurately modeled uh, the nonlinear material behavior. So this is creep, buckling, or ablation. So this is this is a, like an explicit uh, solver that that can model these phenomena. Uh, the structural integrity. We have looked at uh, these cases where we need to model the how the structure would behave at these environmental uh, conditions. And then I was talking about having all this information together and at one place uh, for all the material that's going to be used on the vehicle. So which this, this comes down to how the data is going to be managed in terms of material properties and what intelligent information you can derive from it. Because that's that's your ultimate goal. You want to be able to see what um, how the properties look like. What would be a good material to cho choose from for a particular application, and manage all the material at one place so that you do don't lose track of what was used at the component level and how the properties were uh, measured and uh, used. So that's uh, a platform, man, a material management platform that can be used to track everything. Now coming to communication and tracking, uh, the electronics on the, on the vehicle, they have to be analyzed, the electronics reliability, their life cycle, how much life is going to is remaining on these electronics. Are they going to work for the entire product life cycle? the sensor modeling and the <clears throat> the radio radio and gps jamming so that would be the cosite the antenna analysis that needs to be accurately modeled however and if your antenna is going to behave in the uh, required manner or not so uh, i'll go over a couple of examples in this area which relates to the communication degre degradation and blackout that usually happens when these vehicles are surrounded by ionized gases and at these and operating conditions that's that's very common to happen <clears throat> So now in the event if uh, a plasma exists it will behave as a metal so that would that would basically have a shielding effect around your vehicle and it will cause the rf performance to degrade and then uh, the your systems or sensor systems can be effective so this is an important phenomena that needs to be taken into account and needs to be modeled so 
to model this in fit if we look in terms of what modeling capability would need you need to include a especially varying complex conductivity model so what we have done in our high frequency electromagnetic solver called hfss we have included this capability now the conductivity will vary in space and it that needs to be included to capture the effects on the rf system so we'll see through a couple of examples how this has been modeled and the electromagnetic solver how it uh, how it can then simulate the effect of communication blackout for uh, for these vehicles so going into a little more detail on the implementation part uh, the complex conductivity model the it's utilized so we are using the ansys uh, fluent for each special location so number of uh, density of electrons number density of non electrons and temperature so all this input is coming from the flow solver and then that is used to <clears throat> calculate the conductivity that's going to be there and it's going to be specially varying and these are all the, I'll, i'll not go into too much detail of all the uh, the equations here but these are used to calculate the get the information from the flow and then calculate the conductivity behavior uh, in, in the medium surrounding the vehicle so this using this approach this is the this is the prototype that was simulated that was used as a test case and first of all the flow was simulated around the vehicle it's at mark number 20 its turbulent reacting air is modeled uh, the altitude pressure and temperature values are mentioned here and uh, the angle of attack is 10 in this case and the flap angle is uh, uh, 21 degrees so these are the mark number contours around the vehicle so initially the uh, the validation case was at mark 20 but we have we ran these uh, cases at mark 10 to make the the comparisons and also evaluate the degradation in the antenna performance so you, you can see the air temperature contours around the vehicle and then the electron concentration was that's the input that's going to be used to calculate the communication blackout effect so then the database was created for permittivity and conductivity so these you can see in these two snapshots below now uh, there are there are regions of high electron concentration that you can that you can see from these results as well and how, now it the once the once you have all this information then you can use um, then you can run the electromagnetic solver including this information and see how this uh, can decay you know the signal communication to a receiving antenna so a simple bow tie antenna with a dielectric radom was installed at the uh, rear of the projectile as you can see here so is the antenna location and its shape and it was operating at a frequency of uh, 300 megahertz now you can see bit, uh, if you look at the animation on the left and then at the right at Uh, different phase angles you can see that the communication in the on the right is has degraded a lot the electromagnetic field is has has reduced a lot because of the communication blackout effect so the left animation is where you don't have any ionization of gases you don't have this blackout effect and in the right you see the effect so this this clearly shows that this effect could be really important and these operating conditions and with uh, uh, this uh, simulation approach you can effectively see and then you can really optimize the location of your uh, antenna and also its strength and you can see how much 
uh, during which phase the communication blackout will be highest and how much time it would take to come uh, the vehicle out of it once it's out of that flow regime and it comes back to a state where it's not covered by a ionized gas um, <clears throat> envelope. So the second case, which was uh, uh, simulated to uh, reflect this effect was a hyperbolide re-entry vehicle at Mark 15. And the validation is done at, at Mark 10 in this case, due to some, some limitations on the simulation side. So the pressure and temperature conditions are mentioned here. And in this case, uh, the mixture of 11 species was taken into account in chemical non-equilibrium modeling and the uh, Gupta chemical reacting model for air was uh, for used. So this uh, shows the, uh, the boundary conditions, pressure, far field and outlet boundary conditions, the dimensions of the uh, hyperboloid uh, <clears throat> red, uh, body and the operating conditions. You can see the Mach number around the body going from zero to 10. And then the recirculation area is also highlighted here at the flap corner that was, that was captured accurately. So first the flow solution was validated at Mark 10. Pressure coefficient and a standard number were extracted along the, along the surface. And you can see the match very well with the experimental data for both the variables and the Mach number, pressure and temperature contours are also, can also be seen here. Then the plasma modeling was done in the electromagnetic solver. So once you have the charged species and temperature that you can be imported to calculate the specially varying conductivity uh, using the equations that I have shown before. And then that information is used to um, calculate the electromagnetic field around the vehicle. And uh, here I'm just showing the molar concentration and concentration around the vehicle for this, for the given, uh, given flow conditions. And then a helical antenna was, uh, was modeled and at the rear of the vehicle and the conductivity, well, the variable conductivity around the vehicle along with the electromagnetic field generated because of the antenna was superimposed. And then you can see the effect of antenna in ionized air versus when the air was not ionized. And you can again see the, the shielding effect here because of the ionized air and the communication blackout. So these two examples were, were used to demonstrate how the communication blackout can be modeled in simulation and um, we and, and then the, there are several ways this information can be can be further utilized. Now the last um, topic that I would like to touch upon is the system integration piece of it. So we have looked at, uh, discussed about electronics reliability, the integration, envi integrated environment where all the systems need to come together and operate effectively to uh, make this mission a success, right? For your, for your vehicle. Uh, so, if we look in terms of uh, taking a reference, this is a reference in terms of military war game, there you have uh, several vehicles. They could be drones uh, communicating with uh, missiles, communicating with helicopters, your Navy ships, as well as fighter jets in a, in a connected environment. And all this can be modeled in a 3D environment along with component level modeling using ANSYS physics models. So ANSYS uh, AGI solutions can enable this mission engineering uh, behavior. And I'll quickly, this is uh, just a one minute movie, so it shouldn't be too long, but what it shows here, you have you have a mission, you, you, you need uh, you have certain targets you need to achieve with these different uh, vehicles of uh, doing the uh, operating in, in tandem in a connected fashion. 
So as you saw, this was a quadcopter and the antenna located on it can be simulated with high fidelity physics. And then that information can be embedded in this mission engineering to evaluate the mission engineering scenario. And similarly, on a, on a Navy ship, you have the electromagnetic uh, simulation that can be done on its, uh, on its antennas and how they are communicating with, with different vehicles surrounding them. So this can even be extended to the satellites as you can see here. And uh, the last vehicle that we have, we had, that we had is, as part of this uh, uh, communication setup was a fighter jet. So this, this gives you an, an idea of how it can all be tied from the component level, high physics, fidelity, high fidelity physics-based model all the way to enable the mission. And this is this was uh, done with the ANSYS AGI, and there are there's again a lot of communication of data that goes back and forth between different solvers. And my whole point of showing this example is to uh, give you an idea of what what can be done with simulation. It's not just limited to high fidelity physics, where we are looking at a very specific component of the the entire product, but it can be tied all the way from component to system to system of systems to you know, to evaluate your the performance of your entire mission and make sure it will be a success from end to end. So to wrap it up, uh, I'll just highlight a couple of things. So we are collaborating with uh, several uh, institutions as well as uh, industries in this area. And I'll highlight just three new collaborations that we have in the area of hypersonics. So the uh, first one is with University of Texas Arlington. They have uh, set up a hypersonics research lab, which we are collaborating with. And the test data collected there will be used to validate and develop some of our uh, solver capabilities. The second one is with uh, Missouri uh, SNT. And then the third collaboration we recently have with, is with the University of Colorado Boulder. And all these universities are also part of the recently formed uh, University Consortium for Applied uh, Hypersonics. Um, and uh, so there is there is a lot happening in this area and we are we are very active and uh, open for uh, collaboration and also the one of the one of the things that you really need in this in this area to further develop your simulation capabilities is the availability of test data so anything that we can get to compare our solvers against to do further benchmarking, we would be we would be interested in. Okay, so I'll skip this. I think we have looked at it a few times. There is an extensive suite of validations that we have done for hypersonic flows. And uh, they are, as I mentioned, we're always looking for some you know, good quality wind tunnel data and physical test data for further uh, benchmarking our solvers. So there is also a, a training, a hypersonics uh, training that we are conducting. It's a two day training uh, that will uh, cover all the validation cases and also the flow structural and electromagnetic modules that I have uh, touched upon in this uh, in this talk. It will go into much more detail on of how you set up the case and how you uh, customize it for hypersonic. Uh, uh, scenarios. So just wanted to have it out there. There are a lot of publications that we have on this topic. They have the few recent publications that I have uh, listed here. And uh, these, these will be available for your reference later on. So please feel free to reach out to us if you are interested in having a copy of uh, one of these publications. So that's that's all I had for today. Thank you again for for this opportunity, and uh, you know I can take some questions now. Great, wonderful talk. Yeah, that was very exciting. Uh, 
Dr. Sassen, I think there are two questions in the Q&A box. Can you see, see them? Uh, okay, let me look at the Q&A. Okay. Okay, so the first question I see here is how does ANSYS test or verify the accuracy of the simulation platform? This, that's a uh, that's a very good point, and that's what I was trying to uh, emphasize upon when we when I was talking about the validation cases. These are very uh, sometimes the very complex uh, simulations, very unique flow or structural or electromagnetic physics that you need to deal with at these conditions. So it's very important to make sure your solution is accurate. It's able to capture the required physics. So what we do is we, of course, continue to look into uh, further refining and developing our numerical uh, capabilities, our physics-based methods for these applications. And then we use good quality test data uh, that's available out there to benchmark our solvers. So the next question is at what mark number should we worry about communication degradation? So that happens when you have uh, uh, ionized gas surrounding your vehicle. So it will usually be at a very high mark number. I have seen that to be more uh, of, a, of a issue and challenge that you have to look into at mark number 10 or above but it will depend on the local flow conditions as well. So uh, that, but that's the overall uh, number that uh, can, we can uh, look at. Are you able to simulate integrate a time varying plasma field? Yeah, so the answer is uh, yes, it can be done with the, uh, uh, the transient approach in the flow solver, and it can give you a time varying snapshot of how the plasma field would look like as uh, as you change the uh, the flow as uh, the flow conditions change around the vehicle. Next question is how much of a difference does projectile size make in aerodynamics? Okay, so aerodynamics, if I, if I understand your question right, is very, very uh, sensitive to the external shape of the structure of your projectile. Uh, if it, there are there are any sharp corners or uh, the, uh, the 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 aerodynamic shape is is such that you are going to get more recirculating zones flow zones on your on your projectile it's going to increase drag and uh, increase thermal loads and increase aerodynamic loads so the projectile size would, uh, if the shape is similar, then the size would not uh, be that, uh, that, that would not affect the aerodynamic behavior, but the shape has to be uh, taken into account to really uh, understand the aerodynamic uh, properties. Mm -hmm. uh, do you hear me, Vanisha? Sorry. Oh, oh yeah, of course. Yes. Um, there are a couple uh, more questions here. Do you... uh, on that question, yes. So, yeah. so molecule size doesn't make any difference, as in, you know, if the pro if the projectile is smaller in relation to, because molecules around it will stay the same size. So the size of the projectile doesn't make any difference. I would have, ima have imagined, I mean, I don't really know, but it doesn't even make anything. So you, okay, so you are asking about in terms of, uh, probably I'm not, I'm getting the question. Uh, so the the size of the molecules around the projectile is so, is that so, what? Uh, so no, I'm just asking if um, mm -hmm. since the, since the molecules of the air around the projectile remain the same size, I would imagine mm -hmm. maybe like a smaller projectile would would slide through them a little easier. Is that a thing? So uh, if 
so the size of the molecules versus the size of the projectile if we are if it's still uh, as as far as the projectile is is concerned if it's still like big enough this order of magnitudes the magnitude different as compared to the size of molecules that it wouldn't that this factor wouldn't would it make a difference cool right? okay. it would still see it as a like a Uh, but if the projectile is of the order of size of the molecule then of course then the the the, the behavior would be different and uh, you are looking at uh, both of them as individual particles instead of uh, like a, a, a like a bluff body for yeah. as far as uh, particles are uh, ions are concerned thank you rashi yeah that's what <laughs> what i think cool um uh, Okay, so the next question is: Do you know how much the CFD training cost and what requirements are needed? So, in terms of the cost, I will not. Since I don't know what's the latest uh, number they have, I will not make a comment on it because I could be wrong. Uh, and requirements are there there are really there are really no requirements they will if you are not familiar with the with the solver there are basic uh, training modules that are available as well and will be provided to you to to f- so that you can come up to speed with the over you become overall you become familiar with the solver and then you can uh, you'll be able to set up more complicated cases uh, in terms of the cost what i i mean i let me go back to that slide so roger jao is our training coordinator and he would he would know the answer um, to that question so i will i will i can check with him and get back to ken and he probably can share that information and you can contact contact roger uh, jao directly as well his uh, his email address is mentioned here what turbulence models are used in hypersonic regime so we are working on uh, um, uh, enabling uh, multiple turbulence models uh, in our solver so the density based solver of uh, which which is within fluent is being is being developed and uh, right now i think it's uh, we have uh, uh, sst uh, model and also the one equation i think uh, uh, spala telmeris and k epsilon uh, model that are uh, available in the hypersonic uh, regime the next question is what are the current materials that are able to withstand mark 10 and above in practice leading as your temperatures uh i'm probably not the expert on the uh, probably not the right person to answer this question i'm not the expert on the material side of it so uh i'll i'll have to look into the specific material that that are being used at these uh, high mark numbers but that's that's obviously very you know important uh, important question when it comes to uh, the design of these vehicles okay so the next question is can you repost urls in chat uh, sure sure i'll do that i can i can send uh, a, the list of uh, links and i can post them after after the session is over and you can you can uh, visit those links then okay so i think i'm done done with the questions here as can if uh, if if there is any anything else that you see on your end i can uh, probably take that now Uh, okay i think uh, earlier i think urban have uh, urban has a question oh i think he actually asked how much does the training cost yes so uh, and uh, i i i i already answered that that question i don't know the exact number right now i don't want to give a wrong number so i can ask 
and get back to you on that. And uh, meanwhile, I mean, I have also mentioned the contact of our, of our training coordinator, Roger Zhao, here on the slide. So you can directly reach out to him and check on the on the pricing for this specific uh, training it has been evolving for past year or so so they might have different uh, uh, duration of the training and uh, pricing as well and as, as well yeah uh, okay i have a question because in in your bio you mentioned machine learning do you apply any uh, machine learning in this uh, those projects for hypersonics yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a um, good question. I'd like to answer that. So the machine learning part of it is uh, is very very exciting when it comes to simulation, and there has been a lot of work that's going on. So what we are doing in that domain right now, in our flow solver, we are training the turbulence models based on some uh, benchmarked data simulation data on on some on a on a particular class of problems uh, they are not in the hypersonic regime yet but they are we have tested up to supersonic uh, regime so close to mark 1.7 and have been training the uh, gecko model that's available in fluent to to accelerate the uh, the simulation of uh, around these around these uh, geometries uh, and uh, simulate the flow in much faster using using the trained turbulence models instead of uh, doing the uh, the large uh, eddy simulations LES simulations which would take much longer so that's the continuous area of development in next couple of releases, you will see that as part of the standard uh, fluent solver. So that's that's one of the examples for, for machine learning. Well, it, well, thank you so much. It will be great. And next time you can give uh, us a webinar about machine learning. It doesn't have to be hypersonic, you know, some kind of introduction. Yeah, yeah. Next, I'll, I'll see yeah, what would be a good time to yeah talk about it. I think well, we just need to have enough uh, you know enough to talk talk about what we are doing in that domain, but that yeah definitely would be a good topic for next. Yeah, time. yeah. Well, uh, whatever. Uh, the other question I have is is uh, there's a quantum compute compute computing quantum computer. Uh, there's a. Uh, do you think that is going to kind of help uh, for uh, your system? You know the efficiency or speed or things. Yeah, that's a. Um, yeah, that's I'm. That's a good, uh, good, uh, good, good point. We are we are looking into it. Uh, this is uh, something I I know we are we are currently investigating. I personally have to have to learn more about it. I've I've not looked into it uh, much yet. Okay, don't worry. About it. Actually, Jose, uh, post a question mm -hmm. in Q and A box. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see it now. Uh, what are the challenges in accurately modeling ablation effects? So if we look in terms of the uh, simulation, the ablation is basically where you, where you are going to model the degradation and uh, chipping and all that that happens for uh, to the material in, under those uh, environmental uh, and at those operating conditions, those flow conditions. So it's a very uh, like... Um, challenging problem in terms of the coupled physics you need to be able to model the uh, the structural the uh, the material properties uh, through that entire regime and how it will impact the the structural integrity and the material integrity and how it will so it's a it's a transient problem right so that makes it even more challenging and uh, right now we in terms of the capabilities that we have in at ANSYS, that's still developing we we don't have a, a perfect solution to model ablation that's a that's an area that we are actively working on 
Okay, fantastic. So uh, if no further questions, let's thank uh, Dr. Swati Sasena for this uh, fantastic, amazing uh, presentation. So exciting. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's uh, move on with our next uh, great speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Stephen Thomas from Parsons. Uh, Mr. Thomas is a program assessment lead, a campus technical uh, investigation leadership, supporting critical national security projects in air, missile, and space defense uh, in the Parsons. Uh, he currently works at Parsons and has over 25 years leading program assessment and complex technical investigations in increasing positions of leadership supporting critical national security projects in air, missile, and space defense. Recognized, uh, he's a recognized expert in the following techno technical areas, model-based system engineering, MBSE, software development integration, uh, 2D, 3D modeling and simulation, advanced visualization, uh, environmental phen phenomenology, electro-optical, and infrared signature analysis, uh, kinematics, geographical information system, GIX, embedded hardware software development, and the multivariate uh, optimization. Uh, basically, uh, Mr. Thomas is a physicist. Uh, he was uh, has a very solid background uh, and the training and lots of experience. He, got, he did his graduate study in applied computation, computational physics from George Mason University in Virginia. Uh, and uh, it's also uh, prior that he was uh, study uh, research in theoretical physics in Kansas KU, University of Kansas. Kansas. And uh, he also got a Bachelor of Science in Physics from Missouri State University. Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, the, the training uh, in Missouri uh, for electrical engineering. It's a pre-engineering program. Uh, he did very well and got the you know, uh, scholarship of the program, uh, fellowship. And uh, he also uh, was uh, doing the, uh, you know, uh, further training uh, previously uh, with Oklahoma State University. Uh, so he has more to share. He has a very exciting background. So uh, that's to welcome Mr. Stephen Thomas for the fantastic presentation. Enjoy. All right, thank you very much. Um, we'll just go ahead and, and um, uh, start jumping into the presentation. I'm gonna share my screen so we got some background here. And uh, just let me know if everybody can see the screen. Yes, I can see it. So okay, can great. You see it? Yes, yes, I can. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I have uh, quite a varied background starting out with doing uh, more of technician type work and then going all the way up to uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, theoretical and computational physics work at the end. Uh, I've been um, uh, at Parsons for about five years now, and uh, Parsons is mainly known for being a uh, construction company. We have construction projects all over the world, but we also have a, a couple of divisions where we are working supporting the, the DOD, and one of my specific clients is the Missile Defense Agency. This particular presentation is... Uh, is based on uh, one of the presentations that we made to the MDA Chief Architect's Office. And it is about uh, doing digital engineering. Uh, we, we have simplified a lot of the uh, uh, input in this because we wanna maintain, um, uh, we wanna keep away from any classified actions or classified data. But uh, what we'll go into here, let me click on the, the slide here, is uh, we'll talk a little bit about digital mission engineering our PDEF framework, which is our Parsons Digital Engineering Framework, which is uh, a uh, COTS-based set of tools that we've integrated together. And we're gonna apply that to a uh, hypersonic use case. Now, typically I show this, I, I would do a live demonstration as well, but uh, when you're uh, working with doing optimization and multivari multivariate optimization techniques, a lot of times the, uh, the runs last uh, hours and hours and hours. So it's, uh, it's easier to show this demonstration in a, in a PowerPoint form. And then we'll talk a little bit about the MBSE uh, portion of this where we do the MBSE execution summary. Uh, we, we do have a uh, collaboration environment uh, that's based on uh, uh, the, the no magic product line. Uh, I didn't really include that one in, in this particular uh, 
a set of slides. Uh, we do use a systems toolkit quite a bit, quite extensively. And then we've also been expanding that into their uh, Cesium product line for web-based uh, 3D visualization. Now, in order to run our uh, digital engineering framework, uh, there is uh, some roles and missions, and uh, we kind of go over that and then a quick uh, summary. So with that, we'll just uh, kind of jump right in. Um, I'm not sure how much uh, everybody knows about uh, digital engineering and model-based systems engineering, but basically it's a way to start managing complexity. And what you can start doing is by going with the virtual models, it's very similar to some of the stuff that um, uh, was shown in the previous uh, um, in the previous presentation, where it becomes very expensive to uh, go through the cycles of the design and come up with the models and test those uh, and bring them back into the virtual environment. So going to that virtual environment leads to uh, earlier prototyping and uh, being able to go through that that expensive expensive part of the design cycle less. Um, so that gives you the ability to give early deliverables to the government. And also when you have this in an MBSE environment, we have uh, additional procedures that ensure uh, authoritative source of truth so that everybody's working from the same uh, data sets. And it also uh, helps us being kind of like the, uh, uh, we help support the government who are the stakeholders in these types of uh, development projects. And we work with the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers. So we're kind of that translation that helps ensure that all of the requirements are being uh, fed to the uh, OEMs and the OEMs are building things to the specs that the under government has uh, developed in their requirements. So, um, we're going to kind of jump on to the, the next slide. This one is very specific to the MDA, uh, partially because I just said we have a, uh, a digital commonality with the uh, MDA national team, which is a, a group of um, OEMs like Boeing, Lockheed, Raytheon that all work together on designing these very complex systems of systems. And that's where this digital engineering process really comes in uh, strong with being able to manage all this complexity. So, and in this particular part, we're going to talk about digital mission engineering, and this is kind of a little bit higher level than uh, uh, what was previously shown, where we're, where you're designing individual components that go into a system. We're, we're taking this kind of a little bit higher level up and looking at how all those different systems work together to be able to perform the mission. And so um, when you're doing this, you this type of um, exercise, you're still uh, exercising the uh, systems engineering V. Uh, and I don't know if you're very uh, familiar with that, but that has the uh, four, port, four parts of the uh, engineering uh, process where you start out with requirements engineering and do go into concept development. And then you do the design, build and test. And there's a lot of flowing back and forth between that be before you get to the uh, uh, mission planning and operations. So in having this in a uh, digital engineering environment, what it helps alleviate is like in current engineering practices, you have several different companies uh, working in several different engineering groups. And uh, a lot of the uh, previously, M, uh, previously uh, system engineering work was all done with paper products. And so you would uh, write specs and those specs would get uh, transferred over to other groups. And, and in a lot of times there would be um, uh, uh, specs that uh, were out of date. And so we were sharing out of date data. And so that leads to the more misunderstandings and misinterpretations. So what we try to do is strive for having a, a authoritative source of truth that all the different engineering teams can all interact with and, and help straighten out that uh, process. So uh, a little bit about our uh, Parsons uh, digital engineering framework. Uh, it is a model-based simulation driven framework that is used to support model-based systems engineering for the analysis of very complex systems of systems. And uh, we do this mostly with uh, commercial off-the-shelf tools that we've pulled together into this framework. We are very model agnostic. Uh, we work with uh, various uh, engineering teams at the MDA and we can incorporate their simulations into our workflows very easily. They don't even have to be resonant on our computer systems. We uh, have done some uh, demonstrations where we've connect with companies uh, all across the US and uh, built a uh, virtual uh, network 
where we can pass data back and forth through the tool set and be able to execute models and simulations remotely through the, uh, the interface. Um, the main tool that we use is called Phoenix Model Center, and that's kind of the core for the um, simulation portion of the, uh, the architecture. And it has an inherent uh, analytic capability. It supports uh, about 25 different um, uh, multivariate optimization uh, techniques and um, uh, algorithms that we can integrate directly into the workflows. And also with the other portion of it, and there's a graphic towards the end that shows how all this fits together, is that um, uh, we have a uh, MBSE tool set, which we're currently using uh, the No Magic uh, Cameo tool for our MBSE needs. Uh, it could easily be uh, swapped out with the IBM Rational series of tools. And there's a couple of others that we can uh, uh, use as well for that. But what we do is uh, we help design and build the uh, MBSC descriptive diagrams the descriptive models uh, that uh, describe all the different interactions and then capture the requirements and how they relate to the different pieces of the model. Those uh, value properties, which represent uh, uh, key performance parameters or key system attributes uh, can be mapped into a uh, connector tool we call the uh, MBSC. Um, uh, model center MBSE, and that allows us to uh, seamlessly pass those requirements and KPPs over to the modeling and sim world, where we can validate those requirements through the simulation techniques. Uh, we're also uh, building this into a uh, enterprise level uh, engineering framework for all these different processes, which also includes a, a uh, business process language uh, backbone so that we can have a fully integrated uh, uh, a fully integrated process that is repeatable both on the management side and on the engineering side. So just to kind of step through how all this works and we'll, we'll jump to the, uh, uh, to the scenario here on the next slide, but uh, in the MBSC process, you're, and it's the same for the systems engineering process, is you start doing requirements determination. And in our case, we're going to look at a, a series of, of hypersonic uh, trajectories and we're going to apply those to a, uh, uh, an architecture of sensors to see how well those sensors can see that. And we will run some optimization analysis on that. And then plus we'll also do some probabilistic analysis and then we'll integrate that into our MBSE uh, architecture tool where we can perform trade studies and uh, validate those requirements. And then those validated requirements can go straight back into the requirements determination phase as the system evolves and it, uh, the mission evolves and, and uh, everything starts getting larger and more complex as your uh, threats are evolving as well. So let's jump into the next slide here. And uh, this is um, uh, some output that is done in systems toolkit. And what we did in this particular one, uh, due to uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, security concerns and stuff, we uh, used a uh, simplified MATLAB model and uh, to model the hypersonic trajectory. We also have uh, tools that we use that are directly in integrated into a systems toolkit as the uh, Aviator Pro with the proportional navigation component to, to it uh, that allows us to design these types of trajectories as well. And Parsons has a couple of, of uh, tools that they have built that can uh, generate these types of trajectories as well, but they're at the classified level. So what we wanted to do is we take a, uh, a typical uh, threat. Now this is uh, very notional. It's not to be implied that uh, uh, this is any of the real analysis work that we are currently doing for the MDA. But uh, let's just take an example of uh, having four launch centers uh, out of North Korea all coming to attack um, a point on the West Coast. And so we took our uh, MATLAB tool and what we did was we wrapped it into our Phoenix Model Center uh, simulation uh, orchestration unit, and we ran that tool 50 times. And what we did was we uh, modified some of the launch points. We, we kept it basically to uh, one main aim point, but we uh, varied the, the uh, uh, maneuvers that happen on the uh, AOA trajectory that we're doing. So there's different numbers of uh, humps that it goes through on its uh, cycle. There's uh, a different 
numbers of azimuths and different altitudes that we ran this at. And this could be expanded for additional use cases. And um, in the MBSE world, the use cases is just this, where you set up an analysis uh, venue where you can start looking at how does your requirements uh, uh, meet uh, this particular threat. Now we're going to use this set of data uh, to look at a, 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 an architecture of sensors and try to determine track opportunities. And so on the next slide here, uh, what we have is a uh, sample architecture. So you have a, uh, some ground-based radar systems, you have uh, some sea-based systems, you have uh, other ground-based systems over here that are uh, forward deployed. And each one of these um, systems here are our mobile systems. And um, not to get into too much details, but these are similar to like an Aegis ship. And this is uh, uh, similar to the uh, uh, sea-based X-band radar, which is a very large uh, long range radar system. Now, uh, the ships in this platform up here are, are, are all mobile. So what we did was we defined operational areas for these ships to, uh, to work in. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is that uh, uh, given an order, order of battle, that uh, 50 shots that are coming in from North Korea, where would be the absolute best places to put these uh, mobile sensors to maximize the amount of viewing time that they could give to an integrated track, which would uh, be closely related to how well can you defend against these, because you, you can't shoot them if you can't see them. Uh, Secondly, we're going to do a uh, probabilistic study and say, now that we've determined the absolute best places that we can locate these ships, we're going to say, what is the most likely? So we're going to apply a, um, a three sigma around the best possible locations and study that and see what the most likely uh, locations would be. So now let's talk a little bit about our uh, uh, Phoenix Model Center tool. This is a uh, production tool and uh, a commercial tool. And what it allows us to do is generate what's called a wrapper or an interface to an existing toolkit. So uh, a systems toolkit has a very advanced uh, wrapper that's available for it. And what we did here is basically we took that scenario and uh, in the wrapper, you can expose all different kinds of variables. So what we wanted to do is expose some of the uh, positional data and uh, data on the uh, uh, parameters of the, the radars. Now, in this particular um, uh, scenario, we did uh, kind of downtone the, the radars to, uh, instead of using a uh, high fidelity um, phased array radar model in this one, we're using a template tracking radar model, which uh, uh, helps keep us away from getting into any uh, uh, classified discussions. So once this uh, has been wrapped, you can see all the variables that you want to expose. It's very simple to do that. We can pull those into what's called a problem definition. So we're going to be using the optimizer that is in um, Phoenix Model Center. And in this particular case, we're using the Evolve um, uh, genetic um, optimization uh, algorithm. And so in doing that, we, uh, we want to take an objective. Now the objective function is a report output from the uh, systems toolkit. And in this particular case, what we've configured the uh, system in, we made a constellation of uh, sensors, and then we're doing a uh, chain access between the constellation of sensors and the constellation of uh, threats coming in. So this is simulating a, uh, an integrated uh, track function where all of these uh, uh, viewing times are being inputted into a central location to uh, generate that uh, common field of view. So um, what we wanna do is take that uh, complete access time, how long can you see all of those missiles coming in? And we want to maximize that. Now we can add additional functions, like uh, we want to maximize other parameters in the system and we can add those in as well, but we need to wait those. So there's a, a waiting factor, a waiting function that's uh, fairly simple and straightforward. It's just a, uh, a zero to one kind of wait. And so you can um, uh, put two, you could put two in here. And if they're both equally important, the weight would be 0.5 and 0.5. Uh, 
What we want to define also is down here, you can see these are all the latitudes and longitudes of the mobile platforms that are in that scenario. So these are going to be the, uh, the starting values, which are the center of those purple blocks that we had on the previous slide back here. Uh, those go into the uh, current position, and then there's an upper and lower bound, and those upper and lower bounds represent the uh, upper and lower bounds for latitude and uh, upper and, and uh, lower bounds for the longitude. So that, in essence, defines that box. In this particular case, we're going to use continuous design variables, so it can be placed anywhere in that box. We can do discrete values uh, if it's kind of an irregular shape or we can uh, uh, generate what's called a uh, parts list, which is a series of, uh, of discrete values. And we, we did that in a, uh, one of our production studies where we're looking at the uh, layered homeland defense and where to place radars. And these particular systems have uh, various locations that they've been approved for, um, uh, that be, they've been approved to be deployed to. And so in that case, instead of using continuous functions, we're using uh, lat long pairs for the different uh, locations that, that they are allowed to use. So let's go into the next slide. This actually shows the results. Now this particular one took uh, about uh, eight hours or so to run. So that's why I don't go through and, and doing these. But when you start to execute the program, uh, it will pull up a, a, an instance of systems toolkit, populate it with the data, and then it will start going through and uh, looking at the, at the inputs that it's manipulating and then look at the output. And then the genetic algorithm will do it in a series of about, I think, uh, 40 or 60, uh, 60 runs in a generation. It does some statistical analysis on that and then picks the next uh, seed for the next generation and so forth and so on. So in this particular one, what we did was putting those all in the center of those purple boxes uh, it gave us a max track duration. So if you add up all the times you know, of these uh, green portions of the trajectory, uh, it came up to 101 seconds. And you can see over here that there is a, a big glaring problem over here, and we're, we're not addressing that in this particular study. But you can really see from here that a, another sensor is really required to maximize your ability to track these systems. But for the case of this uh, demonstration, we're uh, just running it like it is with optimizing within these operational areas. So we ended up using the Evolve genetic algorithm to do 1,632 runs and it started to converge and the uh, best track duration was 1094, which is a little bit over 9% increase from the centroid locations. And, and when you start making very complex types of, um, of, of um, sensor sighting studies like this, this particular one doesn't have a lot of, uh, of terrain problems in it, but when you're looking at uh, doing this on terrestrial and land-based uh, radar systems with uh, digital terrain elevation data in it, you get a lot of masking problems and the difference in your location can be tenths or hundredths of a degree. So it becomes very difficult for to, to do this as a manual process. So after we ran the automation of this and and had it converged to 1094. This is how it, uh, it started to come in. Using the Evolve algorithm, it's doing each of these design generations uh, is a set of, I think, like uh, 60 runs. And you can see the individual runs here, and it, it really actually uh, started to converge pretty quickly, but you didn't get your best result until about uh, run number 1547 out of those. And so when we look at the output from the tool, uh, that run number 1547 gave us that 1094.47. And then these are all of the values for those lat longs of those mobile platforms that we had in there. So now we're going to take those and we're going to do a probabilistic study. So we said we found the absolute best location that we can put these to maximize that integrated sensor coverage. Now we're going to go back through there and we're going to apply a uh, probabilistic analysis to it. And in this case, we're going to do a, a regular Gaussian distribution and do a three sigma distribution about that. So we start putting in those uh, standard deviations for the uh, Gaussian distribution. And in this case, I'm just going to do a Monte Carlo series of runs. So what we did is we wanted to run uh, 500 Monte Carlos uh, with that distribution on it and do a histogram of what comes up most of the time for your uh, viewing time. 
And in doing that, you can see here is the, the histogram. You've got some outliers here that get very little time. You have some outliers over here that get a lot of extra time, but over here in the mean is, is what we're looking at. And when I first took a look at this, uh, I saw that I was getting way more viewing time than was available. And so obviously some of those uh, uh, lat longs out of that distribution are out of bounds. Now, when I set that experiment up, I could have put in the same upper and lower bounds that, the, uh, uh, that I used in the original study. But since I know that the uh, very best time that you can get that's in bounds is uh, 1094. So I can apply a simple filter to this and say, anything over 1094 was out of bounds for the experiment. And what actually happened is a couple of the Aegis systems, uh, when you do a, a three sigma on lat long, sometimes that can be a pretty large uh, delta in your uh, location. And uh, they went out of bounds because they had a pretty small operational area and they ended up on land. So when I checked the results, we, I, I found out that I really needed to uh, bound it a little bit better. So I applied the filter to that and you can see here all of the, uh, the red values are um, out of bounds. And so when you look at the histogram for the uh, maximum number of, uh, of viewing times, that maximum number ends up being uh, 1075. So we went from a perfect score. If you have the absolute best locations, you get 1094, but you're probably not going to be right at the best locations, but you're going to be somewhere close to that. So what ends up happening is this becomes a goal requirement. And then the 1075 is our threshold. So now we've defined a threshold and a goal, uh, KPP, uh, based on uh, a repeatable uh, workflow process. Now, what we're going to do next, and this is what I just say here in the requirement study, we did the optimization study, and uh, we went and did the uh, three sigma distribution. We went for 1094 for the absolute best, so that's our objective requirement, and 1075 became the threshold requirement. Now, these requirements are also dependent upon the sensor's field of view, field of regard, and in this case, instead of running a high fidelity uh, radar equation on this, we used a template tracking method, and so it makes it easier for us to display a maximum detection range and use that as a design parameter in this particular case. But now, since we've got that workflow, we're going to extract that workflow out of the uh, uh, model center tool and publish it to what's called the analysis server. And once it's in the analysis server, we can pull that into the MBSC modeling environment. So what we've got here is we've started to take a look at all those different requirements that we uh, started incorporating into our studies and analysis. Uh, that we began with. And you can see down here, it's a little bit hard to read, but um, these are component level requirements. These are uh, sensor field of view uh, requirements. These are uh, sensor detection um, uh, parameters. And we've simplified them to be from like power, power aperture and things like that down to uh, a detection range just for the purposes of this uh, uh, demonstration. But you have your, uh, your sensor parameters, which are your lowest component level requirements. And each one of those sensors is resident on a platform. And those platforms have to be located at various places or within various operational uh, zones. And those become your system requirements. So each one of these systems has sensors. And then above that, all of these systems are contributing to an integrated track file. And that's where you have your system of system requirements, where we are saying that the uh, system of systems needs to have a, at at least a specific um, track file time. And if you can meet that, then you're meeting those requirements at a system of systems level for your mission response. So uh, once we started looking at those requirements, we went in and started building. This is from an, the MBSE tool. And uh, this is called a uh, block structure diagram. Uh, we could go into a whole, uh, a whole presentation on exactly how all the MBC modeling works. But in this particular uh, case, we're just going to kind of hit some of the high points. So your, your block structure diagram is basically how you decompose your uh, system or system of systems in this case. So 
we have a system of systems that's going to provide hyperglide uh, defense, um, uh, a hyperglide defense. And what we're going to look at is we have a max track time that we're trying to get to of, of uh, 1,094 seconds. Now that hyperglide uh, defensive architecture is composed of all those different facilities that we saw. And each one of those facilities, these are called value properties. And uh, each different uh, uh, level has different value properties associated, which is pretty much uh, aligned with your requirements here. So those value properties start to become inputs for your requirements. And in order to do the analysis, you need to do what's called a requirements satisfaction diagram. Uh, these are all things that would have been done using um, matrices and uh, Excel spreadsheets in, in the past. Now this is in a living model. And if I were to go in and change something, like if I were to say ship four is, is uh, uh, Aegis spec seven, and change that, it would flow through the entire model that every time you saw a ship four, it would be changed to Aegis Spec 7. So that gives you a little bit of the, the power that you can have when you start having a, uh, a living model to do your uh, architectural designs on instead of uh, static documentation. Uh, over here, we have our, uh, our hyperglide defense uh, architecture here with all of our different blocks. And what we're saying is this Mac max track time, which is the value property over here, is going to be satisfying a shell statement. Now, a shell statement is a, a specific requirements language that would usually be in the requirements database. And uh, it, it usually comes out in a textual form like this. The system of systems shall maintain a target track for a minimum of 1075 seconds and have a goal of 1094 seconds. So this is establishing your threshold and goal statements for that particular uh, requirement and defining the metric or the value property that is associated with that. Uh, next, what we'll go into, there's various different types of, um, of uh, descriptive uh, models that uh, can be built in your MBSE uh, architecture. Some of those have to do with use cases where you have activity diagrams and entity state diagrams. Uh, in this particular case, this is called a parametric diagram. And what I'm doing here is preparing the system to be able to connect to the uh, external modeling and SIM workflow that we developed previously. So what we've done here is we've pulled in all the different block structures that have value properties that will participate in on the analysis workflow. And then we bring in what is called a, uh, a constraint block. Now this constraint block here through the tool set I use, I connect to the analysis server and I identify that uh, hypersonic workflow that we built using the uh, MATLAB and systems toolkit. And I insert that in here and it shows up as a big blue block. And it will say, it will have a bunch of, uh, these are inputs and uh, these are outputs. And these nodes are, um, are pop up in the model. And what we do is we connect the uh, value properties to the inputs. And then also we go to the other side of the, the simulation where there's outputs. And this is that max, max track time in seconds uh, output that comes from the uh, systems toolkit uh, chain access report. So in, in this particular case, what we've done is we've uh, mapped all those to it. Now, when you start getting more and more complex and interrelated uh, systems, these types of uh, parametric diagrams become much more complicated, but you can carry through that interdependency that uh, uh, was talked, talked about like in the previous one, where you have mechanical, thermal, and electrical, and propulsion, and all of those things have interdependencies on them. You can capture those in these parametric diagrams and connect them to your analysis workflows. All right, so now that we've got all of that uh, pulled together, I would go into the MBSC tool and uh, there is a, a, a toolkit um, a plugin for there. And when I uh, click on that analyzer button, it brings up this interface here. Uh, manage constraint blocks is where I would go in and, and connect to the analysis server and pull down that workflow and drop it into, the, uh, uh, into that 
parametric uh, diagram. But since that's already been done, I would just go over here and click on evaluate designs. So when I click on evaluate designs, it gives you all these different structure pieces over here, but we designed that parametric diagram to be associated with the uh, hyperglide defensive architecture. So when I click on that particular block, you can see down here that there is a tracking analysis workflow associated with that. So when I click on that and expand out the, uh, uh, the variables with that, you can see here are all those properties that were shown. And uh, these are all inputs with the green arrows on them. And down here you have an, an output here called the max track time with an X on it. And it says that it's currently unknown. Um, that is because it hasn't been evaluated yet. And so what the first thing that we would do is go ahead and do the evaluation. And so in this particular case, it pulls all the original values from the um, block structure diagram. They're copied over here so that if I wanted to do a manual study, I can change some of these and reevaluate. And we'll do that here in just a second. <clears throat> so, uh, in the demo, I'm running. I'm usually running this part in real time, and it takes about you know 30, 40 seconds to uh, to be able to execute that. And what it did is, um, I, I clicked on Run, and it uh, pulled together the workflow, uh, exercised the SDK scenario, populated it with all of the original values, and then evaluated it. And when we look at that, uh, the max track time came out to be 1094.47186 blah 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 seconds. And you can see here that there's a big green check box there and 19.472 seconds. And that's because uh, 1094.47 is uh, 19.472 seconds greater than 1075. And if I would click on that green check box, it would pull up the requirements viewer. And this would show the exact um, shell statement that is associated with that. Um, when we get to the full up, diagram of the, the architecture, a lot of these uh, shell statements are uh, kept resident in a requirements database, such as uh, IBM has a, uh, a requirements database tool called DOORS. And uh, there's a bi-directional connection to that so that if I wanted to modify my requirement here, I can send it all the way back and have it uh, sync up with the DOORS database if, if I so chose. But here we can see that you are meeting that particular uh, requirement. So one of the things that I want to do is if we look through this system, you can see that uh, one of those sensors, and that's that uh, uh, C-based platform out there, has a 5,000 kilometer range sensor on it. I want to know what would happen to my requirement if I reduced the range of that, because I feel that uh, 5,000 kilometers is just way too big for this particular scenario. So what I did was this first thing, I said, what would happen if I made that uh, max detection range uh, 1,000 kilometers? So I put that in the system, and this would become unknown again. And so I would reevaluate by clicking on Run. And when I run that time, you get 1038.47, and you get a big red X, and uh, 36.52 uh, seconds uh, is how much you missed the, the, the threshold by. So 1038 is 36.5 seconds less than 1075. So now we know that that particular requirement uh, is broken if I go with a design variable of 1000 kilometers for that particular sensor. So I could go back and I could start changing those values around and just kind of, of check and see what I feel would, might be something that would work. Or I can use a trade study tool. Now over here, we can start doing a uh, automated trade sweep or a design of experiments. And what I'll do is I I'll click on this and do a trade sweep because we're only looking at this one particular variable right now. So when I click on that trade uh, sweep, it will bring up a, uh, another uh, interface that says, okay, I want to look at that design variable, which is that max range on that, that particular sensor. And I just would drag it over to my design variable uh, interface here, put in my starting value, my ending value. So I'd put 1000 as my starting, 1500 as my uh, ending. And then just to make it easy, I'm only doing six runs in this because when I typically run this in a real time uh, mode, this, this takes a couple of minutes to run it. So it's not too bad. So I put in uh, six samples. So it's gonna give me a 
uh, 100 kilometer step size. And then I want to see how that affects that uh, max track time, which is our main requirement that we're looking at down here. So I would put that in and hit run. And what it will do will bring up the, uh, the data explorer and it'll start running those iterations of that uh, trade sweep through the systems toolkit model and then looking at that output. And so, of course, we know run one, uh, 1,000 kilometers does not meet our uh, goal or our threshold, but we start to see when we start increasing the range of that sensor, we went from 1038 to 1058 to 1079. And I see there on, on run number three, I've actually hit the threshold by a little bit. And if you go to, to uh, the fourth run, a 1300 kilometer range sensor, I've reached the goal of 1094. So I've also found that uh, when you start looking at increasing it, that range further to 1400 or 1500 kilometers, I get no more um, capability out of the system of systems. So what we've just demonstrated here is that um, for that particular use case, now you may wanna aggregate this with, with multiple use cases, but for that particular use case, the 5,000 kilometer range sensor is, is so much overkill that it wouldn't be really required for that for defense with that type of system. You could get by with a uh, 1,200 to 1,300 kilometer range radar, which would be much easier to build, uh, much less of a risk to build, and uh, would be probably quicker to uh, deliver. And those types of uh, analyses can also be put into the workflow when we're looking at the multivariate aspects of it. So we can chain together uh, cost, risk, and scheduling uh, programmatic tools in with the design tools. And um, uh, that way you can get a better look on the management side of this as well as the design side. So let's go to the, the next one and let's kind of goes over the uh, summary of what we did. So we started out doing requirements development where we started doing some studies and analyses. And in this particular case, we had a workflow that incorporated MATLAB systems toolkit and some uh, custom scripting where we looked at uh, some of the different types of um, rounding errors and did some comparisons in there. And in doing that, uh, we developed some uh, requirements. And in the real world, that would be going into a requirements adjudication phase, and they would be stored in a uh, DOORS uh, database or similar type of database for doing uh, requirements. And that becomes part of your authoritative source of truth. So from that, we started building all these different uh, types of diagrams. And I know I didn't get into uh, very many of them, but you would start doing your, uh, uh, your uh, block definition diagrams for your mission, start tying those uh, block diagrams to your different types of uh, requirements for your requirement satisfaction. You would look at some of these operational use cases and would probably start developing some state, state machines to look at the flow of data and make sure that that's all working correctly. And uh, then you would start incorporating those into parametric diagrams where you can put in the constraint block, which is your connector to the outside modeling and sim world. And so this is kind of your cycle that goes over and over and over again as you further refine your requirements or as requirements change as the threat evolves or different systems come online to address those threats. So kind of lastly on, on this part is uh, we have been working extensively with uh, Systems Toolkit for doing our visualization, but we've also been working with uh, some of their other products. This is uh, based on the Cesium product, and this is a uh, web-based interactive 3D. It looks a lot like um, uh, 3D Bing Maps or uh, Google Earth but uh, we have a lot more control over how we can uh, import data back and forth. And so we have some automation tools that take those scenarios and publish them to the, a 3D environment. <clears throat> we also have a, a database connector that stores all of our different uh, analyses outputs into a, a SQL database. And we can connect to that SQL database with uh, either standard tools like Power BI or through, uh, we have uh, some of our in-house developed digital dashboarding tools that allow us to pull up that data and be able to visualize it and analyze it in uh, various means. <clears throat> now, in order to do all this stuff, it's not just a, a one person uh, kind of uh, system. It requires a lot of different subject matter expertise in different areas. 
Now in our system, we have a uh, physical network of computers that is in its own enclave that has a, um, uh, that has a connection to the outside world through uh, a global protect um, so that uh, we can uh, uh, safely connect to it remotely. And we have a second portion of this that is resident in the Microsoft Azure cloud that we can add in the same types of capabilities using a virtual network of virtual PCs. And in some cases that becomes uh, a better environment because it allows you to be able to rescale your systems so that if you have a very computationally intensive um, workflow, you can do that through a uh, virtual HPC or through a, uh, set, a uh, cluster of very high-end computational nodes. Uh, it's very easy to reconfigure those that way. But in order to do this type of uh, system, and this is how we're doing it with the, uh, MDA, the MDA right now, is that we have a, a, a lab director that is the main interface between the, uh, uh, the uh, lab and the client. And since this is heavily involved with uh, model-based systems engineering, and that is its own specialty field in itself, we have an MBSC administrator, which is our subject matter expert on that. We also are working with several different types of uh, simulations. So we have a modeling administrator. And since this is uh, hosted on a series of networks, you need to have some sysadmin support. So there's a system administrator uh, uh, as a management person. And then you also have to have a lead anal analyst that helps guide and direct how the workflows are developed and what types of questions are being uh, answered and how to uh, do those. These uh, uh, main people, make up a configuration control board, which adds that extra level of configuration management that makes sure that we ensure authoritative source of truth and deconflict any of the workflows that they are working properly. Uh, underneath that, you have the worker environment where you have the execution, and that involves the same kinds of people. There's uh, modelers that do MBSE modeling, and those modelers work with subject matter experts and uh, coders to help build the, uh, the models and simulations that are used to evaluate these systems and to help build these uh, uh, interfaces to integrate those into the entire system. So you have uh, code developers and m and personnel. And then of course you have the analyst that executes the analysis plan that the uh, lead analyst helps put together. Uh, also on top of this, since these are all commercial tools, we, we did run into some uh, lessons learned. Uh, Commercial tools work well together when they're all at the same uh, version, but uh, they're always getting updates and, and new capabilities to the uh, commercial tools. So you need to keep uh, a handle on the sustainment of that and deconflict any issues that may happen when you have a new release of a software. Um, we had some uh, uh, things that we had to resolve when SDK went from SDK 11 to SDK 12. We had some other issues we needed to resolve when uh, Phoenix Model Center went from Phoenix Model Center 12 to 13.5, and now we're adjudicating the version 14. And so to make sure that things all run well together, uh, a lot of what I use the um, uh, Azure environment for is to do the uh, sustainment testing and be able to make sure that everything's gonna be compliant, works together when you publish it to the, uh, the main, uh, uh, production environment. And then also it's good to have a trainer that uh, is cognizant of all the different workflows and how things change when the uh, commercial software uh, updates come out. So kind of looking at a summary, this is a, a functional diagram of our uh, digital engineering environment. And this is where I talked about earlier that there was a collaborator um, environment and this is a specific uh, web-based tool it's a it's a server that allows you to take your uh, MBSE diagrams and publish them to your collaboration group and they can update those diagrams kind of like you would uh, update a uh, an Adobe Acrobat or a Word document and then you can contact the lead for that specific uh, uh, mission area or engineering area and adjudicate those issues. And so that's what's done in the, the teamwork uh, cloud and collaborator here, which works pretty much with the Cameo systems modeler. On the uh, left side here is all MBSE related. Uh, there is a DOD uh, framework 
uh, architectural framework uh, standard that is a little bit different than what you would do in MPSE. So there is a, a translation tool, it's called the UPDM, which allows us to take standard DODAF uh, um, database uh, entities, pull them into the UPDM and convert those into SysMill types of diagrams. And the same thing for here with the, with the Data Hub. Uh, typically the government uses DOORS, which is an IBM tool for uh, uh, doing uh, requirements database tools. And uh, database, uh, Data Hub is a database connector. So we could connect to the IBM DOORS tool with it. We could connect to a SQL server with that. We can connect to uh, various types of uh, data sources to be able to pull that requirements. And both of these uh, objects are bi-directional. So if you make changes in the Cameo Systems Modeler, you can propagate those back to the DOORS database, but you have to be real careful about that because you'll be working with your authoritative source of truth. So a lot of times we don't make this as a fully bi-directional. Uh, it's bi-directional, but it has a stopping point here where it has to be approved before it would update the DOORS database. Uh, what we have over here on the other half of it is we have our core tool, which is Phoenix Model Center, which we build those workflows. And in those workflows, we build the interfaces or wrappers for various types of tools. And we've done this for uh, virtually every kind of tool that's out there. Uh, there's an ANSYS plugin for, for Phoenix Model Center that's out there, but we've also done this for various uh, types of simulations that, that don't even have uh, programming interfaces. Uh, we can use these uh, uh, wrapping tools to develop uh, input files. Like in the case of the extended air defense simulator, it has a, an extensive set of um, XML based input files. And so we can decode those, manipulate them and run uh, the EAD SIM tool uh, automatically. And then we run the output uh, processor for it automatically and pull out all the uh, data, all the data output. And then we can use that for analysis and feedback loop to be able to run that multiple times. Um, the uh, Model Center MBSE is our uh, plugin that allows Model Center to talk to the Cameo system. And then we developed a uh, SQL database connector uh, to specifically to port all of our output to a uh, SQL database that allows us to connect some of our decision analytics tools, our digital dashboards, like I showed you before, and different types of immersive graphics uh, tool sets to be able to visualize what's going on with the uh, studies as you progress. And with that, uh, that ends my uh, presentation. Are there any questions? I think there's a question from Randall in Q&A. Did you see it? Yes, I said, do you have a process for evaluating the robustness of uh, generated requirements for meeting operational performance requirements? Uh, yes, there's a detailed process for that, and that's part of the, uh, the studies and analysis. Now, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the MDA, they do have a, uh, I think it's called IPLS, and uh, what that is, those are all the different types of uh, unfunded requirements that they have come up with. And so what we can do is when we start going through that uh, studies and analysis process, we're looking at that, um, uh, it is a prioritized list of uh, requirements that need to be met in the next evaluation of the architecture. And so that's all handled through the uh, studies and analysis portion of it when we develop the requirements. I have a question that you mentioned this uh, great study and uh, uh, research, but um, is, is this is something that uh, you and Parson developed for um, that you're going to just like Phoenix, Phoenix, you know, uh, uh, that uh, you can sell it to customer or is specific for BLD? Okay. Um... We can, uh, we can sell this to uh, uh, multiple customers. Uh, we did sell this to the uh, Missile Defense Agency. They uh, liked this process and this capability so much. Uh, they said they wanted it. And we have an instantiation that it has been deployed in two places. One is down in Huntsville, uh, Alabama at the, uh, the main MDA office down there. And then there's a, uh, a classified office that has it in the Northern Virginia area. Um, 
the MDA liked it so much, they said, we're going to buy it, but we want to call it MDEF, the MDA's Digital Engineering Framework. <laughs> uh, very, very interesting. Uh, so when you say you sell it, do you also package with the fitness integration or they have to get the fitness integration system first? Okay. Uh, when, when we do this, like I'm... Uh, currently uh, working on a deployment to the uh, the DoD HPC network, which uh, I fully tested this on. And um, the government will buy the licenses for the individual products. And then in, in like the HPC environment, we will go in and like all the different uh, uh, wires here that's connecting all these things together, these are the custom code pieces and wrappers and things that we build to integrate all of those uh, uh, systems together. Yeah, I think so. It's, so yeah. the, the government buys the the commercial parts of it uh, as a license, and then we uh, integrate it all together on site. Oh, okay, okay. I think uh, Santosh has a question. Yes, uh, great presentation, by the way. Um, if this is being implemented on premises as opposed to in the cloud and managed by Azure, so services like um, um, my question is, what kind of uh, high performance uh, RAID hardware uh, do you guys uh, require or use uh, uh, for this? I assume at the very least you'd use some sort of serial, serial test SCSI uh, array of sorts for the bandwidth and redundancy and so forth. But what other uh, um, you know hardware from a enterprise storage perspective you guys use or to uh, drive the back end of this uh, of the system okay uh, we've we've done this in uh, a, a bunch of different uh, configurations our um, our physical hardware configuration consists of a cluster of um, high-end uh, Dell precision workstations that use the uh, Xeon processors and the way that we do that is that um, when you do a workflow in Phoenix Model Center, uh, we can connect to multiple computers. And so we could have systems toolkit running on one computer as a, as a computational node. We could have it running, we could have um, a MATLAB running on another computer as a computational node. We could have the, like the EAD sim, uh, simulator running on a third and the uh, analysis server connects all those guys together. And those are just on a standard, um, on, on a standard uh, network, but it is segregated off so that there's no other network traffic there other than the machines. In our, uh, we call it Puma, our uh, Parsons Universal Modeling and Analysis Lab. Um, we have eight computational nodes there. And then I have a uh, Azure based uh, set of VMs that are scalable that, um, are in the Azure cloud on a virtual network, and we're working on connecting those two together. Now, the the, the other nice thing about the um, uh, the Azure node is I have a mix of um, I have a couple of Linux boxes, and I have a, a couple or I have a few um, uh, Windows machines that are all running on their own network. So it makes it a lot easier to reconfigure. Now the Next instantiations that we're doing, one is being hosted in the persistent environment on the DoD HPC. Uh, that one, I, I, I have very little insight into what exactly it's being hosted on. Uh, sometimes it's running on uh, big uh, Cray machines or, uh, um, or running on um, uh, silicon graphics machines because that's the, the main workhorses that they have on the DoD HPC. Uh, but we run in a virtual environment on that one. So to me, it looks just like one big, uh, uh, one big Windows machine that I log on remotely through a web browser. Over. The, uh, from a storage perspective, uh, are you guys using uh, SAS switches or any sort of SAS multipathing uh, in order to, uh, for redundancy and or throughput? Uh, not at this time. We have two things that we do. Um, each individual machine uh, has its own storage on it. So we can access the storage through each individual machine. But we also have a uh, the simulation output repository, which is a very large um, uh, SQL database. 
and that one we we can have it uh it's it's being backed up to a uh, uh a network storage of uh, a network attached storage device on that one so you guys are essentially using ethernet for the nas uh sitting on the network but as far right. as the local those uh you're not quite sure whether you're using like an lsi sas controller or a sas rate controller or anything like that uh as opposed to sata uh no we're just using regular sata on the local stuff oh wow okay so you're not using sas okay no 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 uh each machine has uh like uh uh two terabyte um uh two terabyte uh sata drives and on some of the newer stuff um some of the newer network stuff that I'm using are high-end uh, Dell Precision uh, workstation laptops with Xeons in them, Xeon processors sure. in them, and those are running uh, solid-state, uh, one terabyte solid-state SATA drives. That's what I was wondering because there's always a balance between speed versus capacity. So oftentimes, what's used for storage, well, they'll have an SSD cache uh, sitting on top of the main right. storage. So, uh, so you get the best of both worlds. Are you guys? using anything like that to deal with large volumes of data, but plus also the performance requirements? Uh, no, we have, we have one set that, oh, I mean, one is all virtual when you're going on, on the, uh, the Azure network, but on the, uh, the physical network is, um, uh, the physical network in the lab is all uh, just regular SATA drives that are not, uh, they're not solid state. The, uh, the, the laptop network or the laptop nodes for that all use um, solid state drives only. And then like the DoD HPC uses a, a, a virtual environment. And so I just get a V disk over there. I'm not sure exactly what, um, what that is, but I can, uh, I can manipulate things like the, the storage capacity and the speed. Uh, it depends on how I want to design it in the, uh, uh, in the environment over. Final question is uh, from a security perspective, since you're dealing with national defense type stuff, are you guys uh, utilizing said self-encrypting drives in order to ensure that the data is encrypted and secure uh, at rest? Okay, um, that's, that's a, that brings up another really kind of interesting topic. Um, I'm in Northern Virginia and uh, I do all of my work uh, on the unclassified side, but we do keep it behind a firewall on, on the systems. Now, what I do is those workflows that we talk about, uh, I will develop those using uh, unclassified data sets. And then I ship those uh, workflows down to our office in Huntsville, Alabama, and they take that into their protected environment for their uh, on-site um, uh, classified facility. And uh, Right now, uh, I'm working with them on um, some design specs because their system on the high side is significantly slower than the, the system that I have. So uh, we're, we're working through that, but they're the guys that have all, all the protective uh, uh, drives. And uh, my stuff, it does have, um, uh, some of it does have uh, encryption capability but a lot of times I uh, turn that off because they're all protected behind the firewall and I'm not using any uh, classified data in my experiments, over. So essentially what you're doing is you're doing a proof of concept or a kind of a template, which they then use to apply it to the actual classified data set. That's correct. And uh, it's, it's worked very well so far. Now we're working on improving that. Um, I have, uh, of course, there, there's an MDA uh, headquarters is in uh, uh, Fort, is at Fort Belvoir in Virginia, which is about uh, 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes drive from, uh, from, from my house. And I have accounts over there on the classified side. And we're currently setting up, uh, uh, I don't know if you're very familiar with the uh, DOD high performance computing environment, but um, so the there Jedi? is. No. Um, no, it's 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 a little different. It's uh, uh, it's just called the DoD HPC. You can look that up on the on the uh, internet. And there is a uh, there's like a an Army node. There's a Air Force node. There's a Navy node. I think there's two Army nodes and two Navy nodes. But um, it's a, it's a network of computers that they have a a low side and a high side. And so I can go over to my MDA. Uh, facility 
and I can log on to the high side and collaborate. And I, I will be able to collaborate directly with the uh, the classified data and our uh, uh, an analysts down in Huntsville. Uh, but for right now, I'm doing everything um, in the unclassified environment. And then uh, I have a, um, uh, it's behind a firewall. I have a, a file server that I can post my workflows to, and then they download them, burn them to disk, and uh, uh, run the classified analysis. What uh, was the MBA again? Sorry, I, I, I didn't quite catch the MBA, what the acronym stood for. Oh, the, the Missile Defense Agency. Oh, okay. Got it. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, Stephen, uh, this is very simple. I'm actually, this is kind of interesting. You mentioned there's a fancy hardware for the, the uh, DOD HPC, but you also mentioned about using uh, a Microsoft Power BI on the virtual environment on uh, uh, Microsoft Azure, which is a cloud-based uh, uh, service on their server. So are you referring to you are installing um, uh, your own uh, Azure server on your own hardware? Oh, now that that's that's another interesting thing. Right now, uh, I'm not doing any uh, I'm not doing any classified work on the uh, Azure environment. Uh, Azure uh, did win a huge contract to be the main cloud provider for the DoD, and I haven't checked with it lately but there is a classified uh, Azure environment that's coming online and I would like to migrate to, to that particular environment. Right now um, they're still using the DoD HPC for a kind of like a cloud environment but some of the other things that I've looked into there is a thing called the Azure Stack and uh, basically Azure Stack if you have the equipment the servers you can build a, uh, an Azure cloud that would be an on-premise protected cloud that you could do classified on. Yeah, you're the, right. uh, yeah go ahead. The Azure cloud you're referring to, is that the Jedi contract? That, uh, my yeah, that's right. That's, that's the big Jedi contract. And uh, I, I haven't kept a lot of, of track on it because, uh, you know, Amazon uh, immediately started filing lawsuits and protesting on it because Amazon used to have a, a huge chunk of the uh, the DoD classified uh, uh, cloud computing capability. But Microsoft has now started moving in on that. So there's well, some friction a, going on there and I, I haven't quite kept up with that yet. Well, that's a good thing because we don't want the DoD getting parlored by AWS. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, have you done much cloud work? Um, I, I've just... I haven't really done a whole lot of cloud. I've done a lot of on-premise type stuff on my own. Oh, okay. Um, but but my big observation is that uh, I think AWS is just whining because really the big problem with Google and AWS is that they do strictly cloud. Microsoft is the only one that allows on-prem and for you to set that boundary as to where you want, how much of it you want to be in the cloud and how much of it you want to be in the local stack on-premises, whereas the other ones do not give you that control. And so that itself makes it a no-brainer. Oh yeah, run. now that's really <laughs> driving the, uh, you know, so the, the, the other guys have already lost. They're just whining, in my opinion. Oh yeah, now I'm I'm uh, probably a, a wee bit biased because I've been using uh, uh, Microsoft products for like thirty years, and uh, uh, that's where I do all I do all my programming in Visual Studio. Um, I, I use Azure. I have used Amazon Web Services, and for me, and it's probably because I've done so much stuff with uh, Visual Studio, uh, AWS seemed a little bit clunky to work the, the cloud stuff you. in. I agree with you. I mean, you can do Microsoft stuff on AWS just the same. Because uh, I mean, the one advantage I guess AWS might have is that you have other operating systems other than Microsoft operating systems as a server. Because all the cloud really is is just putting your server in a virtualized environment in the cloud. That's all it is. Right. Uh, Windows Server or whatever. And so if you're using Azure, you're kind of limited to Microsoft operating systems to the best of my I don't know if they well, support. No, uh, I, I, I run a Linux box on Azure as well. I oh, do. Okay, cool. So yeah. then, so uh, then so it was that. My, my limiting factor with the AWS stuff was being able to run Microsoft <laughs> environments. Oh, wow. uh, in AWS, you can uh, instantiate a, uh, a Microsoft server but uh, it's difficult or it's not straightforward to 
to do a, a computational node, a Microsoft computational node, like a regular uh, Windows 10 computer. Oh, okay, but got if I'm in uh, Azure, I've got like, I don't know, somewhere around 300 different variations of, of Microsoft machines that I can use. Uh, and if you went to the Azure website, they, they'll, they've got a listing of, of all the ones that are that you can use. You can use and different server versions. You know, you don't even have to use the latest. You can use older versions, whatever. You have, you have the whole list that, of operations. That's correct. Uh, like in, in my um, uh, Azure-based system, I basically, I have uh, one uh, node, which is a very simple, low-power, um, uh, server that is a, uh, a FlexLM license server. And when I go to that kind of configuration, this is why I like the, the Azure environment for, I have that one um, uh, FlexLM license server, and then I have three different versions of Phoenix Model Center running and two different versions of uh, SDK running. And so they run on different nodes, but they all just pull from the license server. So I can run uh, any version or any combination of versions of the tool set. So I can do testing to make sure that, um, you know, I had some things like SDK 12 came out and I'm like, oh, great, man, I want to use it. So instead of taking all of my production stuff and migrating it to 12, I went in and said, okay, I'm going to do this in the virtual environment. And then I found out there was a couple of conflicts um, that happened between Phoenix Model Center and SDK 12. And so that gave me the opportunity to resolve those. And I worked with the AGI guys and we had a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of fixes came out and got everything working again. And then I deploy that to my uh, physical system. Does, uh, is AWS more geared towards Linux and or Unix uh, server type uh, virtual hosts or? Definitely. Uh, okay, so that's what I was gonna say. It's, it's about, definitely, for the for the Linux side, and then um, I haven't gotten into it too much, but you know you got the Docker environment, and you got all these kinds of things like that. They're mainly they are mainly geared towards uh, Linux environments, like these Docker's, and and uh, I can't think the other the name of them, but uh, you can also do a Docker in a Windows environment, but they're really geared towards Linux. Does uh, AWS allow to use uh, Mac OS X server by any chance? Because I know that the dirty little secret is that uh, iCloud. Which everyone knows about, and a lot of, and all Apple users use, is actually hosted on AWS. Believe it or not, <laughs> uh, that's interesting. I, I never saw a, uh, I, I never saw a, a Mac uh, virtual machine on the uh, on either one, on Azure or in, um, uh, or on AWS. I did, which is kind of interesting. I did integrate my system into. A, uh, a Mac a, as well. And when I, when I uh, access my systems, you just access it through a web browser or through remote desktop. And um, going to the, uh, uh, going to the cloud, they do have Mac versions of uh, remote desktop. So I was able to run it. I, I've even ran my system off an iPhone where I can uh, spin up the VMs remotely and I can do, you know, a, a, a 10 hour optimization study straight from my, uh, uh, straight from my iPhone and then just check on it every now and then to see what the progress is. Yeah, but you're just using the iPhone as a client at that point. You're not using it as a, as a server. Right. As right. A they're just, they're just client, they're uh, uh, remote desktop clients. Sure. Yeah, I was looking more at, more of uh, servers. If you, if there's anything you need to run on OSX server, if there's if there's any virtualization options for that, uh, whether it be from Azure or from uh, AWS, because there are certain things that are designed on the Mac OS platform for which you would need to have OSX service. So I, I had never seen anything that virtualizes that. As I was yeah, I, heard of it. Um, yeah. I I haven't I haven't really done anything on that. My uh, my. Uh, MacBook Pro, I mainly use it for running the Adobe suite of tools for doing some of my graphic stuff. Cool, thank you. Uh, yeah, also right. the sand, sandbox feature on the VMs, you know, they are um, also a good feature for security. Um,
All right. Is there any more questions? I, I was saying the first thing is about the sandbox on the virtual machine on the VM, the sandbox. Uh, that you know could be a good feature. And then the second question I have was was the North Korea in your uh, trajectory uh, uh, graphics uh, slides. Uh, uh -huh. Does North Korea has has hypersonic weapon, or you just use it as a case study? Just using it as a case oh, study. Okay. Yeah, I don't uh, think they have. They have <laughs> no, they they don't. We, we're we're keeping this all unclassified. So okay. uh, since they Scary, don't have that yeah. capability, uh, it was uh, okay to the, use them. <laughs> you know, they just showed the, the their uh, summary SLBM. Uh, you know, in January in the parade, the summary. You know. Uh, yeah. Now that that becomes. Uh, uh, a pretty scary prospect there having a, a, a North Korean SLBM. Yeah, and and actually on the same side, actually I was about to ask you the same the, the the issue because it sounds like because for hypersonic weapon, you know, there's a gliding uh, stage and the change of trajectory. Uh, then the news that also is very difficult to track. Uh, but from your system, it sounds like uh, with all the sensors, it seems to be, you know, uh, can be very well uh, detected. You know, uh, uh, yeah, th that's because in, in this particular case, we have a, uh, a network uh, set of sensors in a lot of different locations. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, th there's there's to me, there's two two really difficult things about a, a hyperglide vehicle um, or I guess three. One is um, like in a hyperglide where you're not uh, using a, a uh, an engine for the vast majority of your trajectory, uh, I think your uh, target signatures are going to be much, much smaller than what we're normally used to for ballistic missile defense. Uh, the other thing is they, they can fly at relatively lower altitudes. And so you'll get, uh, you only get a window that, uh, a narrow window of time that you can track them. So you, you need something where you have multiple sensors in uh, different locations to be able to give you that continuous track. And you could see that, like in the uh, in the first analysis here, we had uh, mobile sensors and fixed sensors here in these locations. But uh, without something here, that that's really something you don't want to have is have a, a big spot there because once they lose track here, your um, uh, track covariance, your uh, knowledge of its position starts growing, growing, and growing. And then they have to get reacquired here. There's uh, three sensors down here, one land-based and two ship-based that, that pick it up in terminal. So you, you really want to have something in this spot here. <laughs> so you think uh, we are well defended using your system right now? Um, it, it gives us uh, opportunities to evaluate where the holes are. <laughs> I can't go into I to too much on, on, on I understand, that. I understand, because you know this is kind of general public confidence about our defense system. You know, uh, China and Russia has been threatening. Oh, this uh, cannot be defended, and uh, uh, it's just something that is uh, the citizen feel. It's uh, do, are we kind of confident in our, our defense system, or there's still some work to to do? You know, some very general well, things. Well. Um, the altitude at which uh, a lot of these guys operate at is uh, uh, kind of challenging. So um, <laughs> I, can't, I can't, can't get into it too much. No, no, but, uh, don't, don't worry about it. I, I, uh, I just kind of everybody question, you know, that kind of thing. You know? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and also for, from this, it seems like, say for example, now we have uh, our, our carrier in, or battleship, you know, cruiser in the South China Sea. And uh, and the China launched the DF seventeen or twenty one the hypersonic <laughs> carrier killer. Yeah, uh, can the system be um, used to help defend? You know? uh, yeah, no, these these systems are all designed to help uh, evaluate our defenses. Um, when I was working in Jamdo, I did a lot of that kind of analysis. Uh, uh, especially with those Chinese weapons for the carrier killers, where you could and couldn't go uh, based on your available defenses and detection capabilities. It gets it gets real sticky trying to trying to uh, talk about some of that stuff. I, I just can't get Gen into it too general, much. Yeah, if not, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's, yeah. Because this but, everybody question you know, from the news and the this and the how do we defend 
I don't have to go with detail, you know, just. Well, you know, um, uh, just like we were talking about, um, uh, just like uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Sasena was, was talking about, when you have hypersonic vehicles going at, at these speeds, you get that uh, ionization and a, a calm blackout. And so if you're gonna fire a hypersonic weapon at a moving target, you're gonna wanna have to be able to do in-flight target updates so that as, the, your, as your target is moving in different directions, you can adjust your trajectory to still come up to an intercept location. So that becomes a, a, a challenge when you're doing um, like a, a hypersonic uh, weapon against a moving target. Uh, so so the, the Victor Victor has a question in the uh, chat um, Q and A box related question. Did you see it? Related oh, to, is yes, it related? we do believe China has hypersonic capabilities. Uh, oh, really? Oh. I, I, um, okay, okay. I think that's it. That's in open source. Now, yeah, no, no. Um, whether it's weaponized, I, I couldn't quite say right now. But uh, I see. I got a question. Um, this, uh, oh, by the way, uh, the hypersonic thing with the ionization blackout, if it's a fire and forget type weapon or notionally, wouldn't that eliminate the need for uh, having uh, updates uh, sent via link other than for uh, termination of the weapon? Um, well, there's two things. One is uh, even if you're going against a fixed target, uh, you may have uh, accumulated errors in your targeting system as you're, as you're flying to it. So you really want to have... Um, some kind of uh, uh, in-flight check to make sure you're going to the right spot. And whether they're communicating with uh, uh, like some, some of our, uh, and this is not hypersonic systems, but some of our systems, they, they have uh, GNS or, you know, GPS or GNSS uh, guidance on it. They have uh, IMUs, they have terrain following uh, radar where they're, they're looking for some reference point to make sure that they're in the, in the right spot. So, um, uh, it's, I think it's less of a problem for uh, systems that are going after static targets, but when you have uh, things like, especially for MDA, where you have a missile trying to intercept a missile, um, you're trying to predict where that missile is and you need a lot of in-flight target updates to make sure that when you get to the end game, um, uh, when you get to the end game, the sensor on board the kill vehicle has a certain field of view and what you want to do is make sure that your track covariance is smaller than the field of view so that you know that your system will be able to, to find the target when it goes into its uh, uh, end game. So even if it has its own onboard radar, like an AIM-54 or uh, AIM-120 AMRAM as an example, uh, you still need to have the target to be within view of its onboard uh, radar or sensor to be able to kill the target. Yeah, now that's that's for the end game. A lot of times, uh, bef before it gets to that end game portion where the onboard seeker takes over, uh, you may want to guide it or change the, the the guidance point. They have a point where the sensor, the onboard sensor, opens up its eyes, and uh, you want to be in a in a good enough geometry that the sensor can find its target. Sure. Well, one thing I was thinking was that there, there's an acceleration time before it goes hypersonic. And before the ionization layer forms, so you could probably do a lot of the updates before that layer forms, and then <laughs> on board guidance, so there's sufficient time uh, to allow for that. Uh, right. Before. If you uh, if you go online, I don't want to over speak too much, but if you go online and look up a DF twenty one, you may find some there. There may be some published timelines on how they do that. The other question I had is that could the same thing be applied for low observable stealth mission planning in which uh, it's hypersonic threats you're looking at radar threats and then uh, and then you can do your flight path planning based on the uh, the radar uh, cross section that you have versus the enemy radar's uh, detectable range and then kind of zigzag your way around can that be done using the same uh, software? Yeah, I've done tons of that stuff. <laughs> uh, um, it, it, the better you build your model, the more, you know, the more uh, uh, knowledge you have of the bad guys, radar systems and models, you can build pretty detailed um, uh, coverage maps and, and they, uh, it's a 3D problem. So um, 
uh, when you're you're looking at a flight path to defeat a uh, an enemy's radar, you certainly uh, can maximize your uh, your aspect dependent RCS uh, with tools like this and come up with a way to get a path through uh, without being seen by uh, implementing terrain, you know, uh, like uh, leveraging terrain masking and, and uh, building masking and uh, managing your aspect, your uh, aspect. So this I, so IS defense uh, uh, war gaming of sorts can be used by uh, Top Gun or uh, Red Flag or the Air Force Weapons School for that matter, I would imagine. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I haven't really gotten into to Top Flag, but uh, I've seen some of their, their uh, outputs and they, they do talk a lot about managing your, uh, your, managing your aspect angle and uh, managing your, uh, when, when you're doing the dog fights and stuff like that, you have to manage your uh, potential energy and things like that as well. But Yeah, but what if the modern day, like, uh, uh, you know, at the uh, Naval Air Warfare Development Command, formerly uh, Fighter Weapons School, not Top Gun, as well as uh, the Red Flag Exercises and Air Force Weapons School, dog fighting is only one aspect of what they do. A lot of what they do is getting in and out of the threat area as well. So that's where I think. My yeah, happens. yeah. And like, you know, when I'm saying dog fighting, I mean, this could be up to, you know, you know, hundred kilometers away <laughs> It's basically yeah. who can, who can see, who can fire first is going to win. Yeah. But that was those... dog, that's just BVR at that point. You know, you might, you're just an interceptor as opposed to actually tangling in a, in a one V one or whatever. In the yeah. circling place. Uh, Stephen, I think Victor has some question. Victor, do you want to speak out your question? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I had a couple of questions uh, that was kind of related to what you just talked about. I don't know if you're the expert in this area, but uh, those, uh, so you have the hypersonic uh, uh, capability, you know, missile hypersonic uh, region, uh, flying hypersonic region for, with missiles. We presently have, we have what they call a hit to kill missiles now, you know, they're not hypersonic. I think they're uh, supersonic and a little beyond supersonic, but not hypersonic, I believe. And able to, you know, hit the kill. In other words, they're able to, uh, say, on a conventional uh, ICBM or not be, uh, a conventional missile, they're able to intercept it and, and hit it by, by knocking out this by hitting it, by getting close enough to hit it. Yeah. Uh, if there's a hypersonic, uh, if you have a hypersonic vehicle, for instance, not say from those uh, <laughs> these uh, uh, these areas here. Uh, you would need another hypersonic or something of the same speed to match it to hit it, right? Right. Uh, the, um, the the MDA has a, a family of systems, and uh, I'm sure everybody's heard of Patriot. Uh, Patriot is the um, kind of like the, the baseline point defense that, that they use in the Gulf and all that kind of stuff. Right. That is a one kilometer per second missile. Now, I'm... I'm uh, now, sometimes I get lost between Mach numbers and stuff like that, but uh, uh, the U.S. inventory has uh, Patriot as its lowest level defense right now. Then uh, Aegis has uh, uh, SM-6, and then there's uh, Aegis SM-3 and THAAD and the GBI, and then there's some advanced GBI stuff on the, right. on the drawing board. Um yeah. You've got a uh, uh, Patriots around one kilometer per second. That is like three kilometers. Uh, uh, SM3 is like around three kilometers per second. So is that up in the uh, region? And GBI is like around five, five or six. I, you know, I'd have to look those up to, to be certain, but those are really hypersonic. Uh, I, I believe those really are in the hypersonic realm. Oh, you think so? Okay. Uh, I was just wondering. Uh... Uh, and uh, the other ones I was trying to figure out, but it's just sort of off subject. Uh, directional control for those hypersonic vehicles. Is it, it, I mean, it sounds like a hypersonic vehicle has to be from point A to point Z, uh, or you know, you, you can't. You have to uh, calculate its trajectory, one time trajectory from this launch to to point of contact, without having to uh, redirect it or anything. It can't be redirected or corrected in flight. Or... Uh, hypersonic can be re can maneuver in flight is that, is that speeds uh yeah um i'm uh uh i work a lot with uh, the agi the the uh, uh analytical graphics that ansys just purchased and uh one of the things that i that i'm working on is they have a tool called moxie 
which it's an MBA uh, model based systems engineering related tool. But the the main demo that we work on that is uh, maneuvering hypersonic. And so the theory is you've got a hypersonic uh, vehicle coming in and uh, it has sensors on it and it's uh, sensing that it's being detected by a, a uh, radar. This is in their example uh, scenario. Sure. So uh, it's sensing that it's being lit up by a radar. So it maneuvers and it goes and does a, like a beam maneuver, which is like changing your aspect and flying in a different direction till it senses that it's not being uh, lit up by the radar anymore. And then it will return back to its original program course. So that, all, that happens all in a matter of seconds, I believe. Yeah, because you're really going fast. And, and when you try to turn, you try to do a little turn and it takes a, a, a very large uh, right. turn radius. Uh, but uh, on the AGI website, I believe under, if you look up Moxie, uh, it'll show you that, that specific scenario where they're talking about uh, maneuvering hyper hypersonic vehicle. Yes, Thanks uh, ballistics do a little bit of that, but not, not like uh, the hypersonics do. Yeah, I was just wondering, because that's pretty high hypersonic speed. I was just wondering, you know, you have to say have some other than flight control services to move that thing because you go to such high speeds that... Uh, yeah, well, like, like I was saying, uh, uh, Patriot's the only, I think it's pa Patriot's the only system that has flight control surfaces on it. But in addition to the flight control surfaces, it has uh, uh, rockets, rockets that uh, that do the maneuvering for the end game. And it's same with all the other, uh, the, the larger interceptors. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, they don't really have uh, aerodynamic surfaces on them. Uh, especially for the end game. And a lot of them are designed to, uh, the bigger missiles are designed to do intercepts above the atmosphere. So they don't have any, the, you know, the, the uh, control surfaces wouldn't help anyway. <laughs> right. that's, that's true. Right. Uh, Stephen, actually, just a quick question. Is that your uh, framework system uh, can handle something or something like a different way, for example, like debris from space or uh, a piece of the asteroid, you know, meteorite, those kinds of things. Right. Um, this is just a framework. Uh, okay. and, and basically, like I like to say, uh, you can do the same recipe with different ingredients. So whether it's a hypersonic or whether it's regular cruise missiles or whether it's uh, yeah, an <clears throat> asteroid coming in towards Earth, uh, it would just be a different tool that you would integrate into the uh, system to perform your analysis. But, but not the, but probably not for something like uh, uh, the drones, you know, oh. the drones. You... Uh, I, I just uh, finished doing a, a an analysis and a proposal is called the uh, AirBed, uh, ABED, Air Base Air Defense. And uh, that's specific to how do you defend an air base against DJI style drones or these yeah. like a uh, class <laughs> class five, I think I forget what they're, what they're called exactly. But uh, I went through and used these tools to design an attack drone to give a, a long range standoff capability that it would defeat most of the stuff that, that you would normally think about for an air base. And then we came back and designed a uh, architecture to defend against that. And then also, uh, it, the ABAD proposal was for defense against uh, DGI types of threats and then a specific type of cruise missile threat. So we had to, de to design basically two kinds of systems. One system is only looking at uh, drones, uh, at defeating drones, and one system was only looking at defeating the uh, uh, cruise missiles, but there were common components to it, like some of the sensors could be reused for both cases. And um, uh, we did have a, uh, a, a laser system in there that could take out drones and given enough time could take out a cruise missile. So you, you got like a primary and a secondary weapon and we had to pull all that stuff into an architecture and show how it all worked together for the proposal. Hopefully in a few months, I can show that presentation <laughs> after, yeah, the, hopefully, after yeah, the contract but, award. <laughs> yeah, well, everything unclassified, welcome, you know, you, you come back, you know, anytime you like. Uh, but one thing I was uh, because I saw on uh, the news that uh, there's um, somebody took a video or picture. There's uh, uh, near LAX or something. Uh, the some I think it's somebody wearing the personal uh, aviation system. It's just like Iron Man, you know, those flying. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Kind of stress>. yeah. <laughs> What can we do? 
uh, <laughs> I, there, there's only like a, uh, there's only a, a handful of people that can, uh, that can do that, that kind of, you saw that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I've seen those guys before. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's getting a little bit more, uh, proliferated with, uh, uh, they have these like micro, uh, jets, um, which is kind of, kind of cool. Um, they're a, a real, uh, they're a real turbo, uh, you know, turbo fan jet engine, but they're, uh, you know, they're the size of a, yes. of a soda can. PM. And uh, it takes like, it takes like six or eight of those strapped onto you to be able to make it fly. I've seen some of these guys fly like that over water and stuff, nothing real long distance. The long distance guy, he's got like, basically it's a jet pack with wings on it and he'll drop out of a helicopter and take off and he's, he's flown all over the place. You mean like Eves Rossi, the uh, jet man, the guy who went over the Grand Canyon and stuff? Yeah, that's, yeah. That's uh, because it's so small and the uh, very varying trajectory, very hard to uh, for the sensor to detect. Uh, yeah, um, but uh, there, there's there's sensors out there, and there there's multiple types of sensors. You don't always use a uh, uh, a traditional radar to track objects like that. There, there's other sensors that you may want to use as well. Um, or if you know, uh, Elliot Segwin, he's a, a civilian test pilot, but he does a lot of uh, very uh, unique and crazy things. He took a long, <laughs> which is a Burt Rutan uh, design, and uh, put uh, two micro turbines on it and uh, flew it around. Yeah. Uh, when we were doing some of the uh, uh, studies for how well you can see things around the DC area, uh, they had guys in some of those little uh, micro jets fly. And some of the guys in um, uh, those, um, oh, uh, shoot, I can't think of the name of that, that type of aircraft. But some of those uh, sport aircraft where you don't even oh, have LSA's a pilot's light, license. Uh, LSAs, light sport aircraft. Yeah, yeah. Some of those you don't even have to have li uh, li uh, pilot licenses for to operate. And they had guys flying some of those around and some of those little micro jets and things like that to, to see how small of an object we could pick up. So. Uh, it's oh, pretty wow. fun stuff. Uh, I hate to say this, but I, I, I have to, uh, get going. Uh, is there any, any last, last minute things? No, I think that's it. I think Judy, thank you so much. Yes. This is fantastic. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, you we can't wait for your next, uh, next talk with us. As you, you mentioned, <laughs> it will be fun. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank Great you. Thank you. Sir. Great All presentation. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh... All right. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you so much, and uh, I wish you enjoy the great program and uh, two great speakers today. Uh, so thank you so much. So stay tuned with our uh, next event, uh, which is next Saturday and the, the following Saturdays. I mean, next Saturday and following Saturdays. Uh, so have a great Saturday and a great weekend. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate right, thank it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you.